Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. May I take this opportunity to welcome you to this public lecture at the University of Eldred, main campus, School of Education complex. The theme of the lecture is the role of universities in innovation and sustainable development. Um, our chief guest today is Dr. Chespak Vassell. He is the director of KTH Global Development Hub at Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, Sweden. Dr. Vessel has more than 20 years of international experience from innovation management in academic environment. He has been involved in many forms of innovations, procedures, processes, including startups, companies, and have experience from many other different types of innovations. Uh, Dr. Jesper is with us today, and I want to welcome all of you by inviting our DVC Pre, Professor Philip Raburu, to give his opening remarks. Welcome, Professor Raburu. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Director, before I say something, um, I please request the ICT to check the uh, check, make sure everybody is uh, are muted except the persons who are speaking, and also check the volume uh, so that at least uh, members can get what is going on uh, more audibly. Uh, so, with that, I just want to also take this opportunity to welcome uh, our uh, special guest for this day, uh, Jasper Vassell, and also our Vice Chancellor for um, uh, uh, setting time aside so that we can be able to have this function this afternoon. Our public lectures are very important in the calendar of the university as a means of uh, a, a sharing ideas. And uh, we thank our visitor today uh, because he's addressing an area which is very important. As a university, we are a flame of knowledge and innovation. And so any innovation thing, I mean, any innovation presentation, anything that would help us to move closer to uh, satisfying our motto, we highly uh, uh, welcome. Today is not my day. I think uh, uh, we have our vice chancellor with us who will give uh, some welcoming remarks. So I just want to take this opportunity, first of all, to welcome everybody and secondly, to welcome our vice chancellor to give her introductory and uh, uh, remarks and then go ahead and invite the speaker to give us the, I mean, to deliver the public lecture for today. So vice chancellor, Madam, Professor Teresa Kenga, you are welcome to get onto the stage. Thank you very much, Professor Raburu, our Deputy Vice Chancellor in charge of Research, uh, Planning and Extension. Uh, our invited guest speaker, Dr. Jasper Vassell, members of the University Management Board, distinguished guests, students, Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Public lectures over the years have been found to be important in the life of academicians as they offer an opportunity to learn and to learn more through diverse disciplines. In, on behalf of our university fraternity, it is a great honor and personal pleasure welcome our speaker, Dr. Vassell, to this forum. 
his experience and expertise of more than 20 years in innovation management will go a long way in enhancing our understanding of innovation and sustainable development. The theme of today's public lecture, that is the role of universities in innovation and sustainable development, could not have come at such a time when universities are grappling with many issues and being required to upscale the innovations to meet the challenging times and face the COVID-19 pandemic without much disruptions. It is clear that the higher education institutions from the, form the epicenter in innovation and sustainable development. This we are called upon to strive to achieve amid the challenges we face in our spheres of existence. The importance of universities in enhancing innovation and sustainable development cuts across both public and private sector. Hence, the main roles that the university plays in innovation and sustainable development is through contributing to fundamental research, contributing to existing knowledge, enhancing curriculum development through education, creating space for open exploration of ideas and enhancing community development agenda. This is evident in the way higher education institutions have greatly contributed to creation of new knowledge, frontier of advanced technology, fostering of economic development, and more so being agents of change in terms of assimilation and absorption of both locally and um, international knowledge. Thus, through our agenda setting strategies, we have been central in enhancing innovation and sustainable development within our immediate surroundings. And hence the motto of our university, the flame of knowledge and innovation. As a university in this discourse, we have recently unveiled 14 policy briefs aimed at informing policymakers on our research findings from the university funded projects. This is because our concern as an institution is majorly on policy and regulatory framework so as to enable us to adequately respond to challenges we are facing as a as, yeah, as a society. Our role in disseminating knowledge and advancing innovation is cutting across and addresses inter-industry differ differences. This is because our research advances affect industrial innovation and in so doing it enhances fundamental knowledge for both manufacturers, processors, and even policymakers within our various jurisdictions. For example, mid last month, the university hosted the National Wetland Virtual Conference, which brought on board industrial players, corporations, environmental conservancies, and other key policy makers from the relevant ministries. And during that conference, issues of wetland conservation were well articulated and more than 89 thematic areas were deliberated on. This clearly stamps our position as a higher education institution in enhancing knowledge dissemination aimed at advancing innovation and sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, it is important to understand the key fundamental areas where higher education institutions contribute to innovation and sustainable development through industrial transformation. There are quite a number of areas and I'm sure our guest speaker today will expound on them. And as at the end of the public lecture, we would have gained insights on how as a university, 
we can enhance sustainable development and innovation. As I finalize, I once wish to once again welcome our guest speaker and thank him for volunteering to give us the public lecture. And in that case, I will welcome the guest speaker to give us the public lecture. But before that, I think Professor Sudoi was supposed to introduce him to us or had he introduced him before when I was offline. I think Professor Sudoi had already introduced the guests. So Professor... Thank I think you, Professor Sudoi had already introduced the guests. So Professor... Thank you, Professor, Professor Sudoi had already introduced the guests. So Professor... Thank you, Professor, Professor Sudoi had already introduced the guests. So, Thank you, Professor Sudoi had already introduced the guests. So, Professor. Thank you, Professor Sudoi had already introduced the guests. So, Professor. More than two decades on actually in, in terms of innovation and, and more recently sustainable development and, and particularly the role of academic institutions with respect to these, uh, these uh, uh, important matters. Um, I think I would like to ask someone to make me a host of this so I can uh, share my screen so you can see my slides. So if I can ask the current host of the meeting to uh, make me a co-host and then then I can technically ICT. go getting my slides up. Mm. ICT, please, could you assist us quickly? Mm. ICT, do we have... Uh... Mr. Unyango, are you there? <laughs> Oh. Oh. Professor Sudoi, can you let us know whether you have reached the ICT to make the speaker the host for sharing of documents? So now, now it's working. Thank you very much. So by that, I hope you can see my slide. So the title of, of, of today's talk, and, and I believe that the entire title of, of this session is the role of universities in innovation and sustainable development. Um, and just a few brief words on, on myself, so you know who I am and, and where I come from when, when it comes to these subjects. I'm uh, my academic background is actually within computer science and, and uh, electrical engineering, but for more than 20 years, actually more than 25 years, I've been working with innovation, entrepreneurship, sustainable development and, and matters like that. And almost always throughout that, that career, I've been in, in what I would, would consider or, or call an innovation management position, meaning that it is it has been my responsibility to try to make innovation happen, to stimulate innovation, to enable innovation, uh, to make sure there are resources for innovation and so on. So it, it's, it's an innovation management career basically. And that has um, almost exclusively been within or close to academic institutions. So I have had plenty of time to both learn and, and, and consider the ins and outs of, of the role of, of the university. And what I'm going to talk about today are my um, experiences basically of this subject and my own conclusions. And as you will see, to some extent, my opinions, meaning that it is not necessarily the case that, that you have to agree with everything I'm saying. 
Um, and I'm, I welcome any such discussion, obviously, on, in, uh, if it comes to that. One thing I've done um, throughout my career is that I have occasionally I've asked we're in, a, in an innovation management position here, but why do we actually do this? Why is innovation important? And what I realized a little while ago was that I have actually been receiving somewhat different uh, responses or answers to that question throughout these 25 years. Uh, initially, when I asked that question, everyone just told me and others in the same position that innovation is important because we need innovation to get economic growth. We need it for economic growth. And that was the very simple response. Uh, it, it, it's a simple answer, though it's not necessarily easy to achieve, but it's easy to understand what is expected. It's economic growth. If I go back um, 10 years, roughly, in, in time, that was the time of, of the Brundtland Commission, where for the first time, I think sustainable development was actually defined, and, and it was the... the starting point of a development that actually um, uh, led to the sustainable development goals as, as well, ultimately. But then sustainable development all of a sudden came up as being one of the important aspects of why we should innovate, why innovation is important. So whenever I asked that question back then, it wasn't just economic growth. The response was, well, we need innovation to actually have sustainable development and ultimately create a sustainable society. And the, the importance of, of the Brundtland Commission is that they defined what is sometimes referred to as the triple bottom line model, where we consider sustainability in three dimensions or perspectives with environmental sustainability, social sustainability, and economical sustainability. Um, and also the realization that these three are in fact communicating in the sense that we can never achieve perfect sustainability in all three dimensions at the same time. Environmental sustainability can very well come with a cost in terms of social sustainability. I've seen many examples of that, particularly in, in, in this part of the world, in, in Eastern Africa, for example. Environmental sustainability can also come with a cost in terms of economic sustainability or economic growth. And why is this? Well, I think the transition from saying that economic growth is the important thing to saying that sustainable development according to this model is the important thing is, re is the realization that the way we pursued economic growth and still do is in fact uh, the reason or the root cause of some of the insustainability of today's society. The way we pursue economic growth frequently generates environmental insustainability and social insustainability, uh, meaning that we have to balance these to each other. I, I want to stress that I'm not saying that economic growth as a goal of innovation is, has not gone away. I mean, it's still there but it's in there as economic sustainability, which in many ways actually is the same thing as economic growth. We need growth, economic growth, to maintain economic sustainability. But I think the important realization was that these things comes with a the cost. They do in fact communicate with each other. And if we went, then proceed in time a little bit, when, whenever I've been asking these questions for the last, let's say five or six years, the answer to the question, why do we innovate? Why is that important? Well, that has got to do with uh, the UN 2030 agenda and the sustainable development goals. That Those are the main goals that we all share. Those goals are global. They are truly global. And we uh, need to work together with innovation and many other things, but, but research-based or knowledge-based innovation is central in order to achieve these goals. And we need to do it collaboratively um, in that way. So I would say that today, I think the main sentiment is that sustainable development in terms of the sustainable development goals is uh, the most common answer to why do we need innovation. And again, economic growth and economic development is still in there. It hasn't been removed. We have several of these goals. Let's just take goal number one, no poverty, as an example uh, of a goal which clearly uh, requires economic development, economic growth, and so on and so forth to, to be achieved, plus a number of other things. 
economic growth is never the, the whole answer to anything, but it, it might be an, uh, a very important component. So I think this is, is important to have as a background when we start thinking about what is the role of a university with respect to this and what, what is actually happening here and what can we as academic institutions do about this. One important realization that has come here, which I think is, is particularly important to, to mention in this context is, is this quote, we are all developing nations from now on. Um, I think the importance of that is to realize that a developed country, a developed economy as in Sweden, for example, where I'm from, is no longer the goal for other developing countries and developing economies. In fact, that's the last we want to see. We don't want to see Kenya develop into becoming a Sweden in, in those terms. And why is that? Well, simply because Sweden being a developed economy and a developed country today are actually, frankly, more part of the problem than the solution if we look at this from the sustainable development goals perspective, which is again why it's so important that we work collaboratively on these, uh, on these issues between North and South, between uh, developed countries and, and, and uh, developing economies, for example. So again, as a background to this, I think this is, is exceptionally important uh, today. Now, with that as, as a background, we can start thinking then about what is the role of the university when it comes to innovation? Well, as you may already have understood, my view is that generally speaking, the goal is that we should contribute towards sustainable development. But uh, how do we actually go about doing that then? Well, it's about innovation management. Innovation management is simply put the act of making innovation happen. Traditionally, the, the topic of innovation management has been associated with uh, single organizations about private sector companies capacity to, to develop innovation. So the practice of innovation management has been associated with commercial development to a large extent. I would argue that we can define something that, that we can call academic innovation management. That is innovation management from the point of view of a university, which I believe should be more associated with the role of the university in impacting society. It's not a, just about innovation for the sake of the organization itself. It's about innovation as a contribution towards society. And then the question is, what is that contribution that we as an academic institution can do? With academic innovation management, I re refer them to innovation management within an academic institution, and it really entails all the organization, functions, competencies, activities, etc., that we are do uh, that we are doing within a uh, university uh, with the aim of creating innovation and making innovation happen. So that's how I de define academic innovation management. It is fundamentally the same as what, what is happening within a uh, uh, private sector company, but it has more got to do with the impact outside the organization, the university, than the internals of the, uh, of the um, organization itself. So if we look at this, then again, uh, from the from a different point of view, in, in terms of the how, sorry, the why of this, um, then we can um, ask ourselves, what is the role of a private sector company regarding innovation and try to contrast that with what could be the role of an academic institution regarding innovation? Then in line with the traditional view of innovation management within a commercial organization, um, having to do with developing that organization and more specifically that organization's competitiveness in a market and improving its productivity. I mean, that's, that's something any private sector company need to do today. We need to work with our productivity and, and competitiveness. So from that point of view, that is a very good definition, I think, about the role of innovation with respect to a private sector company. Improve productivity and competitiveness. Bring out new products, new possibilities, new value propositions uh, that develops a business further. Now, if we look at this from, from the point of view of an academic institution, then what is the role there? Well, I think that the answer to that question is potentially considerably more multifaceted. 
Um, you could say, simply put, that the role is to create innovation from research. Since a university is doing research, so then, then it seems reasonable that the knowledge that we create within research is actually brought to innovation as a way of, of influencing society. We can define it as some do as technology or knowledge transfer, the act of literally then transferring knowledge that has, has been produced within the academic environment, the academic community, transfer that into society so that it can, in, so that it can, can create value. We can think about, about it as promoting economic growth, which is what we have spent quite a lot of time doing, starting up businesses and, and, and trying to, to develop uh, business propositions in order to promote economic growth in, in society, improve competitiveness of the institution if we become a little bit more introvert. Is this interesting as well? Well, yeah, I think it can. I mean, a university, just as any other organization, must think about its own competitiveness and what does this mean to be competitive as a university? Well, it's about being attractive to the surrounding society. It's about attracting the best students, the best teachers, um, and, and thereby also attract the best funding, I suppose. So the competitiveness of the university itself is clearly a, 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 a relevant answer to the question of why we should do innovation. Can it be generating revenues for the institution? Well, yes, absolutely. If we can prove and show that we can that we actually deliver considerable value to society, we are more than likely to be able to increase the revenues of the, of the university and thereby expand our operations. But last but not the least, to contribute to a sustainable society. And frankly, that is in many ways my key answer to this. I'm not arguing that any one of these answers are necessarily more right than wrong, but I think the most important answer is that we should contribute to a sustainable society. So again, as I said initially, sometimes I express opinions here and you may not necessarily agree with me, but my personal opinion based on experience and, and, uh, and based on, on sort of being a citizen of, of, of a country where we have universities, I do believe that the role of an academic institution is to develop societal capacity for innovation in such a way that it contributes to solutions to important societal challenges. And from my introduction, you can see that when I say important societal challenges, I believe that the sustainable development goals are currently the best way of explaining what these important societal challenges really are. So again, this is my view of what an academic institution should do when it comes to innovation. Contribute to solutions to important societal challenges. Now, you may or may not uh, agree with my answer to that. And as I said before, there are multiple possible answers for this. But regardless of what our goals are with innovation and therefore by the, with ac academic innovation management, because what I'm arguing is that we need to look at this from an academic innovation management point of view and look at how can we actually do that. And then I would argue that there are three distinct elements of academic innovation management. One of them is to maintain, develop, and transfer knowledge in ways that enable innovation. Note here, important note, I'm not saying that it's necessarily us as the university who creates the innovation. In fact, I think that's the least common situation. It's much more common that innovation happens in, the, in society surrounding us. And our role then, according to this, is to maintain, develop, and transfer knowledge into society in ways that enable and promote innovation and makes innovation happen. This obviously includes education, for example. Education is a way of transferring knowledge into society. We do that by training people, and then they move into society and apply that knowledge. That can be the source of innovation, but there are many other ways we can do it as well. Secondly, 
for that to happen, we need to develop innovation competence through education. I think we are lacking in education today in universities in general, in the sense that we train students in many different ways of understanding problems and, and how to solve various types of problems and give them a body of knowledge and skills and all that. But what we do not generally teach them is how to turn that knowledge and those skills into a value in society. And that's what I mean by innovation competence, the capacity to make innovation happen. And I think we need to focus on that much, much more. And thirdly, we are not alone in this as, as a university. So what we need to do is to facilitate the development of what I call an innovation ecosystem. That is the interaction between multiple different actors in society, including private sector, civil society, public authorities, governmental institutions, NGOs, etc., community groups, even individuals. Um, participating in the system, collaborating around innovation. And I do believe uh, that the university has an, a very important role to play in doing exactly that and in generating and creating that innovation ecosystem. So these are my three elements of academic innovation management are the three things that I do believe that a university should be doing in terms of, uh, of innovation. Now, if we look at this from an innovation management point of view, because all of those three elements that, that I just showed you, they are part of innovation management. Uh, but if we want to do innovation management in general, for those purposes or for, for any other purpose, there are some things we need to respond to, the answers that we need to some central questions. And it's actually these five questions here. What is innovation? What gives rise to innovation? How does innovation in fact happen? What is the role of knowledge in innovation? And how are innovation processes created and sustained? That those are elements of innovation management. If you're an innovation manager, you need to have some, some answers to these questions. The first question might seem surprising. What is innovation? Isn't that obvious what innovation is? Well, I would argue that it's far from obvious. I don't know how many times I've been in a situation talking about innovation with people only to realize that, in fact, we do not have exactly the same view on what innovation, in fact, is. And if we are going to achieve innovation, particularly in, in a collaborative fashion, we need to have the same view of what innovation actually is. Let me start by giving you three different examples of definitions of the word innovation or the concept of innovation. The first one is, is um, uh, very commonly used and it comes from the OECD. Um, and they say that innovation is the implementation of a new or significantly improved product or process, a new marketing method or a new organizational method in business practices, workplace organization or external relations. So that is a definition that sort of defines innovation from the point of view of what is actually happening or what has actually changed when innovation has happened. There is a new or significantly improved product that it's apparently then a definition of, of innovation or a new process or a new marketing method, etc. So that's one definition of innovation, which is frequently used. If we go to the more scholarly definitions of innovation and go to, to one of the world's most famous um, uh, innovation academics, researchers, Clayton Christensen, uh, unfortunately, he, he passed away a couple of years ago, but he did major contributions towards innovation and, and innovation management research. I highly recommend anyone to read any of, of his writings, actually. He has written a number of books on innovation, which are definitely uh, among the books that, that I can recommend anyone to read who's interested in understanding innovation. His definition of, in, of innovation is that it's a change in the process by which an organization transforms labor, capital, materials, and information into simple and more affordable products. Looking at that, it's quite clear that he looks at innovation as being something that has got to do with a commercial organization, a typical private sector organization. It refers to a single organization and how that organization transforms resources into simple and more affordable products. Again, as the, the definition by OCD, this is a definition that helps us to identify innovation after it happened. 
But you may ask yourself, are these two definitions particularly useful if we look at this from an innovation management point of view? That is from the point of view of being someone who wants innovation to happen. These two definitions, I argue, are mainly useful if we want to identify and find innovation after the fact. But if we want to create it, it's not as useful, actually. It really isn't. I would say that the best definition of the concept of innovation for innovation management purposes is much, much simpler. It's to say that innovation is a change for or by someone and a change that is perceived as an improvement. That is the goal of any innovation process to present a change to someone. And again, look at this from, from the point of view of the other two innovation definitions. They talk about, for example, simple and more affordable products or um, uh, a new or improved product. A new or improved product is a change for or by someone that is perceived as an improvement. Unless it's perceived as an improvement, it won't be successful, right? So from a strictly commercial point of view, this definition is, is equally applicable. But it can also be an expression of a need to change society, to, to develop society, just as well as, as, as uh, um, being a commercial organization trying to come up with a new product. So we can look at the innovation as, as something which is much, much broader in scope than just commercial development. And I think that's one of my most important messages here is to say that innovation doesn't necessarily have to do with commercial development or business development and startups and economic growth. Uh, I will come back to that uh, somewhat in, in, in a few minutes here, but, but it's a very important thing today, I think, that we see innovation as being possible in many different forms than just the commercial form. So to be a little bit more stringent about the definition, we can see that the word innovation and, and, and the uh, concept of innovation is, all, all, is often used in two different ways, where the one is what, what I just said, is as an intended and desired impact expressed as a perceived change for or by someone. Again, it's an impact, it's a change, a perceived improvement for someone. And that is an expression of what we want to achieve. But the word innovation also usefully refers to the process of achieving that and a process usually starting with an idea and resulting in this intended and desired impact. And impact has become a very commonly used word today. We're, we're looking for impact of, of a lot of different things, particularly when it comes to universities and impact of research, impact of education and so on. Um, what we mean by that in this context, in, in the innovation context is that impact is a change for someone which have a significance and have a reach, where the significance is the perceived value of this change. Again, how valuable is this change to me? How important is it in society? Um, and it also has got to do with the reach, which is simply we have a target group in place. How many of these people for whom this is valuable, how many of those people are actually experiencing the value? That's the reach of an innovation, that's the, the second part of the impact. So, so impact is composed of significant and significance and reach um, or, or value and market share if you want to put it in, in commercial terms instead. So this is the definition of innovation and impact that I'm suggesting to be considered to be the most useful one when we are looking at innovation management. So again, in terms of what an academic institution should do, then it is that we should make contributions towards innovation happening in those ways. So assuming that we can agree then on, on this definition of innovation, then the next question is what gives rise to innovation? How does innovation actually happen? Uh, if we're innovation manager, that's what we need to look at. And there are lots of, of understandings and, and not the least misunderstandings of this. Um, 
what is it that actually creates innovation? I, a lot of people think that presence of venture capital, for example, creates innovation or something like that. It, 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 never, it never happens that way. In my experience, after having worked with literally hundreds and hundreds of innovators and entrepreneurs, I would say that innovation is always vision-driven and opportunity-enabled. The starting point is that someone sees the necessity or, or the need for a desire for a change for someone. That is an opportunity for an improvement. That's the vision of the impact. However, just realizing that there is a need for a change for someone um, isn't enough. It's combined with having knowledge that creates an opportunity or that you believe represents an opportunity to achieve that desired change. To come up with a solution to a problem, for example, come up with a way of removing an obstacle, for example, that makes this change happen. So it's always a combination of a vision of an impact and the belief of an opportunity to make that impact. This is the starting point of innovation always, I would say. And this is something that happens in the minds of people, of individuals and groups who identify the vision and the opportunity. Now, when we have this, the vision and the opportunity, then um, we have an idea. And in innovation, the word idea is commonly used and it's a very beautiful word and I really like it, but we need to be a little bit more um, exact about what it actually means in terms of innovation. And that's why I'm saying here that idea is the, an idea is the combination of a vision of an impact and an opportunity to achieve that impact. That is an idea. And that is the starting point of an innovation process, a process that is designed to ultimately lead to the impact. So, and, and I think this is, it's very important to understand innovation in this concept. Um, uh, and understand that these are the things that give rise to innovation, vision and opportunity. Now, in this picture, I drawn the innovation process as a very straight, very unidirectional line from knowledge to impact. Uh, clearly that has got nothing to do with reality. In reality, an innovation process is a constant testing and reiteration and relearning and uh, innovation very rarely ends up where it first intended to. So it, it's, it's anything but a straight line uh, deterministic process. It's, it's actually a search and learning process and, and a development process uh, and a lot of things combined. So to sum this part up a little bit, innovation then I'll so, sort of refers to an end result expressed as a change, but it also refers to the process of achieving innovation. Uh, the innovation process as such is a learning process within we actually change our view of the vision and the, the perceived opportunity since we learn more and more about both the desired change and, and the opportunity. And the driver of the innovation process is really the vision, the understanding that this is a change that is needed and it's a change that we as individuals want to actually do. The opportunity is based on knowledge that we have that enables us to work towards a realization of that vision or towards the impact in that case. Now, if we have this idea and agree on this is how innovation happens, vision and opportunity, then we could go a little bit further in, into the matter of how does innovation happen? Uh, I already indicated that innovation is a process. Uh, so in a sense, the simplest answer to how innovation happens is to say, well, well, yeah, there's an innovation process. But what is an innovation process then? What, what does that really mean? Well, an innovation process is a series of activities and interactions with the aim of bringing together and organizing resources which are needed for an economic activity which creates the, uh, the intended impact. So it's a process that creates what I refer to as an economic activity. At the same time, an innovation process is a learning process, a development process, and a social process. It's a learning process from the point of view that it's all with almost always 
it, it looks like academic research. We are putting up a hypothesis and we test that hypothesis and we learn and then we reiterate based on that learning and that's how we move um, step by step towards the impact. In doing so, it's a social activity in the sense that it brings together and forms relations. And these relations are with other stakeholders who are necessary for the economic activity to be able to happen. But it's also a development process because at some point we start to more, strictly speaking, develop, for example, a solution or a product, if you like. So it's also a development process, but it always starts out as a learning and relationship forming process. Um, and then merges more and more into a, 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 a normal development process. So, um, what do I mean by an economic activity? Because in a sense, you can view the innovation process as being the result of the, um, uh, of the innovation process. Well, it's something that transforms financial material and immaterial resources to interventions which has an impact. And I will talk a little bit more of that in, in, in just a few minutes. But there are also always secondary impacts of an innovation process. An innovation process in and of itself is an economic activity. So an innovation process, regardless of whether you consider it to be successful or not, always has positive impacts in terms of creating economic activity, creating networks, creating relationships that didn't exist before, and by transferring knowledge to society. So we shouldn't be too harsh on, on evaluating innovation processes as being, strictly speaking, successful or failures. They always have uh, an important impact on society. So indeed, initiating an innovation process is an economic activity in and of itself. And, and that is very important to, to remember. Generally speaking, talking about innovation processes as being failures or successes is very difficult because the innovation process changes shape all the time. So what was a failure uh, a few minutes ago might be a success uh, in a few minutes in, in time. So we, we really can't judge them from that point of view. What I mean by an economic activity? Well, it's a, it's a set of planned activities uh, that uses financial resources, human resources, immaterial resources, and material resources. And those activities use those resources to create what I refer to as an intervention. Uh, and that can be a product, for example, a product entering the market. That can be an, inter an intervention. But it could also, and I will give an example of that in a few minutes, it could also be just a transfer of knowledge to change awareness in a group of people and thereby change their actions and, and how they view and thereby creating an impact. We define the intervention as product services, knowledge, etc., and we reach the impact of the target group through various types of relationships, partners, channels, all forms of economic activities and innovation processes are highly collaborative, which is one of the reasons why we can't say that a university is creating innovation. That's impossible. A university can only contribute towards innovation by collaborating with others, because that's the nature of the economic activity and it's the nature of the um, innovation process. So this is what I mean by an economic activity. Uh, and it, I think it's, it's very close to what we usually mean intuitively by um, an, uh, an economic activity. Let me give you uh, two examples of economic activities, which are results of innovation processes. Uh, I believe this one is very well known among you, the M-Pesa system. Um, when M-Pesa started out as, as an idea, it became an innovation process that ultimately resulted in the service that we see and, and I think all of us use today. Um, and the significance of, um, that, of the impact in that case is that it provides safe financial services to a large part of the population particularly to, to uh, parts of the population for whom traditional financial services were not accessible at all. 
one of the more surprising significances of this is also that it has reduced poverty by enabling people to actually do more financial transactions in, in a wider geography, which provides people with more opportunities, basically. So there have been a lot of studies showing that the introduction of the M-Pesa system reduced poverty. So that's the significance in the impact. The target group in that, in that case was clearly uh, the general population uh, as such. Uh, with this. And the reach, I believe, today is in excess of 70% of Kenyan households, which is a considerable reach. So you could say that, that it reaches somewhere along the line of 70% of, of the population using M-Pesa. Now, what is the intervention, if we look at this in this case, in this economic activity? Well, it, it's a product which comes as a service, as, as we all know, mobile payments and, and, and nowadays also other types of financial services associated with this. And what does the M-Pesa as a commercial economic activity do in terms of resources? What does it need? Well, it's a commercial business and customer. So the economic resources for M-Pesa comes from the customers, basically. It's customer driven, right? Cust paid for by the customers, by the usage of the system. Um, the human resources used in, in designing the or building the M-Pesa system are, of course, um, several of, of those, but particularly within digital service design, for example, and financial services. So that's what M-Pesa as an economic activity uses in terms of human resources to be able to create this service and deliver it. Um, what are the immaterial resources used? Well, it's a design of an app, for example. It's the design of a service. So that's part of the, the, uh, those. And what are the material resources used? Well, it's a mobile phone system and, and the operator behind that, like Safaricom, for example, because M-Pesa wouldn't exist without the, uh, the cell phone network for all these reasons. So this is one way of viewing an economic activity, which is very clearly the result of innovation and where the intention was to make a change in terms of bringing financial services to a, a considerably broader part of the population. To give you a very different example, I do believe that, that I think you have heard of, of, of this girl today. She's been a household name on, on a global scale, Greta Thunberg and, and her attempts to work against climate change and to create awareness uh, that we need to do climate action. We have a climate problem. We have a climate change problem. We need to do climate action. And then you may ask, but is that really an economic activity? Well, in innovation terms, it is. So again, if we look at this example, what is the significance of this? Well, the significance of it is to have particularly politicians to take climate actions make the decisions that needed to save our climate and to stop climate change. The target group that she has are politicians and the general population globally, I would say. Okay, so what is the reach? Well, I mean, you could say that it's substantial from the point of view that a, a very large portion of, of, the, of the global population have actually heard of Greta Thunberg and, and what she does. What is the kind of intervention that she does? Well, she started out by having this school strike in Sweden where she sat down outside the Swedish parliament with a sign like this, which says school strike for climate and, and thereby started to creating awareness and more and more people joined this into something called Fridays for Future, which was uh, a, a frequent manifestation of this. She does a lot of public speaking and she uses knowledge on climate change and transfers knowledge knowledge on climate change to people and to politicians. In terms of resources, what does she use in this case? Well, donations, awards, human capital, which is primarily herself, but also uh, an ever-growing number of, of volunteers. Uh, and what are the immaterial resources? Well, it's scientific knowledge on climate change. She frequently re refers to that and, and tells everyone that we do have scientific knowledge on climate change and we need to take climate action. So for her, that, that's a, a, an important immaterial resource. I don't think she, she uses any particular material resources in this case. It's more of the human resources, immaterial, and, and the financial resources in the form of donations and, and awards.
And I would argue that this is also an economic activity that was the result of an innovation process, starting with the identification of a vision of climate action and her seeing, I have an opportunity to create this by actually acting in the way she has. To many, this, this appears to be a strange view of innovation, but I believe that this is a view of innovation and, and, and exposes um, how wide innovation in fact is, uh, and that we need to see more examples like that in the future. Now, going back to the model, then we have a vision uh, of, of an impact, we have an opportunity, and those two together constitute an idea, and we initiate an, an innovation process. So, in a sense, that is how innovation happens, and is always how innovation happens. Uh, and we can be more or less organized in this, and we can be more or less competent to do this. And this is very important, very, very important. There is such a thing as innovation competence. And you may remember that one of my element, elements of innovation academic management was to educate for innovation competence, educate our students in how do you actually create innovation? How can you make a change? And what I want to just exemplify with this picture here is that all of these boxes here represent skills and knowledge that are useful and in some cases, absolutely necessary if you want to be successful in innovation. And to say that you have innovation competence means that you should have these and a number of other skills in this case. Now, the relevance of this is not necessarily exactly what these boxes say, uh, but it's a mes message which I believe is, is even more important. And that is that innovation can be taught. Anyone can learn how to do innovation. And I actually mean that literally, anyone can learn how to do innovation. There is a perception of innovation as being something that only particularly gifted individuals, uh, almost geniuses are doing. And we, and we have the likes of, let's say, Elon Musk who started Tesla and Mark Zuckerberg who started Facebook and, and so on. You, we have all these people which are almost household names and those have led us to believe that innovation requires geniuses. That's absolutely not true. Anyone can learn how to do innovation. And therefore I'm arguing that teaching innovation and creating innovation competence is and must be a central part of academic innovation management. In fact, it's one of the most important long-term contributions a university can do to society. And that is by actually uh, teaching for innovation competence. Now, moving to the second but the last question, what is the role of knowledge in innovation? Uh, as academic institution, knowledge is our core activity, isn't it? We do research to produce knowledge and, and to maintain uh, a, a, a sort of a large repository of knowledge. We do education to transfer knowledge to students and training them and building skills and competencies. And obviously we also then from an innovation point of view should try to transfer knowledge into society so that others can make that knowledge useful. But what is that then? Well, clearly knowledge in my model of this at least is a very important starting point for innovation because it's us believing that we have the knowledge needed to create an impact that makes us move on innovation, that makes us try to do something. We see the impact, the, the desired change, and we believe that we have some knowledge that can be turned into that impact. My conclusion from that is really that if we, as academic institutions, want to create innovation and facilitate innovation, we should define, describe, and communicate knowledge in ways that make it possible for others to see opportunities. Looking at how we traditionally represent knowledge in academic institutions, how do we codify knowledge? I would say that these three here are the most common ones. Scientific publications, we may write textbooks capturing knowledge, and we may look for patents. All these three have rather severe limitations in terms of creating uh, innovation in terms of transferring knowledge in a way that's meaningful to someone else. The scientific publication is written for a scientific target group. 
It's largely inaccessible to others. And furthermore, it's actually incomplete. It rarely captures all the knowledge that we actually have as a result of a research process or a research project. So it is very limited and, and, and difficult to assess for anyone even outside that academic discipline. So it's very limited, although it's, it's very stringent in, in its way, the way it does. Textbooks that cover a broader um, timeline when it comes to knowledge are quite good and it's more accessible to more people uh, since they're actually written to be used in education. Um, so they are fairly complete, but they do have a long lead time. So the current frontier of knowledge is rarely, if ever, expressed in textbook and teaching material, which means that in terms of generating innovation, it has a definite limitation. Patenting, which I'm bringing up here because a lot of academic institutions are looking for opportunities to patent knowledge. It's very limited. It only covers inventions. You know, a patent can only be applied for by something which is referred to as an invention. It, there are lots of forms of knowledge that can be the basis of innovation that are not inventions and particularly not from, from the point of, of, of view of, of intellectual property law. They are very costly and they are highly incomplete. In fact, it's only a small fraction of the knowledge that we manage within a university that can be expressed as patents. So all of these are very limited. I would like to tell you a bit about an experience that actually led us to start working with this in a different way, to move away from these traditional ways. I was an innovation advisor at Chalmers University in, in Gothenburg, Sweden. And my job was to go around among the academic departments and basically ask people, do you have any ideas or do you have any patentable inventions around? That was my job. It was one of the worst jobs I ever had because if I asked that question a hundred times to a hundred different people, I got at least 99 no answers. No, we don't have any ideas. And no, we don't have any patentable inventions if you ask about that. Um, and if you think of it, it's not particularly strange because why should people have a particular idea about some knowledge that, that they have? Because an idea assumes, as we said, a vision of an impact and, the, and realizing the opportunity to achieve that impact. And normally people don't think like that, and particularly not academic researchers. Patentable inventions, well, that is unsuccessful for many different reasons. One of the most fundamental being that the average academic researcher doesn't have a clue about what a patentable invention really is. So why should they look for it? And the question is also, what are the incentives to look for the patentable invention, or are they even important? But the interesting thing, the, the um, observation we made was that the no answer typically came in the form indicated here, where we said there was someone said to us, now we don't have any in ideas or inv inventions at the moment, because we're too busy interpreting the data we got from, from a computer algorithm that we designed to run an, a scientific experiment um, and the measuring ex equipment that we actually just put together to be able to do this. Um, and, and that was a very common answer, meaning that there may not have been any ideas or patents, but there were a considerable amount of, of intellectual assets uh, lying around uh, in this. And it's intellectual assets in forms of knowledge, which can be inventions, but also can be described as models, methods, design, software, data, and so on. Uh, so there are lots, lots of different opportunities and um, and knowledge that was around, but that was never identified because we didn't ask for it. And that led us to say that maybe, just maybe we should look at the knowledge contained within a, within a university, an academic institution in the form of intellectual asset knowledge that is documented without necessarily asking whether anyone can see any particular value of that knowledge. 
We can also look for relation assets. Remember I said an innovation process is a social process. It's about building collaborations and, and bringing in stakeholders, which means that relation assets, that is the knowledge and connections we have with other organizations, individuals, et cetera, are also knowledge assets. And then lastly, we have the competence asset. The people have expertise, capacities, skills, et cetera, which are also relevant for innovation. So if we want to have innovation processes, then in fact, we need to look for all these three types of, of, uh, of knowledge assets. There is quite a lot to say about this model, but time does not permit that today. But I would like to say a few more uh, words on intellectual assets as opposed to intellectual property, because that distinction is very important. An intellectual asset is something that can form the basis for intellectual property. And I think the best um, uh, example of that is to look at patents. As you probably know, a patent, you can apply for a patent on something described as an invention. In that case, the invention is the intellectual asset. The patent is the intellectual property. So an intellectual asset can be used to form intellectual property. The importance of this distinction lies in that an intellectual asset may have a value as a solution to a problem, the invention, for example. The IP, the intellectual property, does not necessarily have that value, except if the invention has it. So when we look for intellectual property, which I know that many academic institutions do, there are lots of misconceptions surrounding that. And I believe, and again, this may come across as controversial, but I, I agree, uh, I argue that the focus on intellectual property by academic institutions is misguided and misdirected and largely um, a waste of effort. This may sound harsh, but I, I have, frankly, I, I actually mean what, what I say. Why is that? Well, because intellectual property is not innovation. A lot of people think that intellectual property is somehow um, a guarantee for innovation. It absolutely is not. Intellectual property only means that you were in, in, in able to apply successfully for a patent for an in invention. With the way we have defined innovation earlier, it doesn't necessarily take you any closer to innovation whatsoever. IP will not create innovation. Presence of intellectual property is absolutely not a guarantee uh, that there will be more innovation happening. IP can be a tool for innovation and even a necessary tool for innovation in some cases, but not in the general case. Intellectual property does not have any inherent value besides the value of the intellectual asset as a solution or an opportunity for someone. The value of a patent relies entirely on the value of the invention that it encapsulates, not the fact that it has been dressed up as intellectual property. And these things are very important to realize and understand. And there, there are so many misconceptions surrounding this. So to move on a little bit more on that and focus specifically on patents, um, and this is really something I, I believe very strongly in this, and, and I'm often concerned by the fact that universities, unfortunately, particularly uh, in this part of the world, uh, are not doing the right thing when it comes to intellectual property. Seeking patents just because you can is a meaningless exercise. It's a meaningless exercise. Applying for a patent just because you happen to have a patentable invention is meaningless. A patent is a tool for a purpose. It's not an achievement in and of itself and shouldn't be regarded as one either. Patent is a very poor indicator of innovation because as I said, patents do not create IP in general, do not create innovation. It may in some cases be necessary for innovation, yes, but it doesn't generally speak in general innovation just because we have a patent. There are relatively few industries where patents are strictly necessary, meaning that if our purpose is to bring something to a market, it's not at all always the case that we need to apply for a patent. In fact, if we do that to gain protection, in most cases, we should consider confidentiality as being a better strategy than applying for a patent. Also, since I know that many 
trying to do this. Universities cannot systematically make any substantial revenues from intellectual property. That is, I've, unfortunately, I've encountered that view that universities, particularly here in East Africa, I've spoken to many, uh, that seem to think or have been given the mission to generate patents with the purpose of licensing those patents and thereby make money and revenue. That simply isn't true. There is no examples historically anywhere of a um, university making any considerable amounts of money from that, including universities in the United States. And that is partly because it's considerably more difficult to sell intellectual property or license intellectual property coming from a university than intellectual property coming from a commercial organization. That's simply because in a commercial organization, the intellectual property has been commercially tested all the way through and it has been developed in a commercial context. That's rarely true about university generated IP. IP might, is important, but not in the way people generally think. And I think there are lots of misconceptions that we need to root out when, when it comes to this. From that, I would like to, to close by commenting on the last question, how are innovation processes created and sustained? Because we said that we defined innovation as an impact, a desired change. We say that it, the, it's a vision and an opportunity that gives rise to it. And we also say then that innovation happens through an innovation process, but how can we actually make innovation processes happen? And even more importantly, how can they be sustained? But that's where the innovation ecosystem comes in. If we look at societal innovation capacity, the capacity of society to do innovation, and not just a single organization, because I believe as a university, we operate towards society and, and creating innovation in, in society and bring value to society. Then we need to look at it from the point of view, what creates capacity in society? Many people talk about policy and the development of policy. And policy is important because it guides, controls, enables and creates incentives. So policy from government and, and, and other authorities are important in this. Unfortunately, there is sometimes uh, people over rely on policy as something that creates innovation, but it doesn't. A good policy is very important, but it will never create innovation um, in and of itself. Secondly, we need resources, financial, material, immaterial resources. Remember that the innovation process had as its objective to create an economic activity that generates the impact. And that needs some resources, so financial material, immaterial. That is also important, but it does not in and of itself create innovation. I frequently hear that people say that there is a lack of innovation in this particular area because there is a lack of venture capital, for example. I think that is a misconception and, and, and you have actually um, mistaken the cause and the effect. It's definitely true that financial resources are needed to maintain an, or, or sustain an innovation process. That's true. But in terms of creating innovation, Money has nothing to do with it. it. It comes from very different things like the visions and the opportunities. And quite the contrary, financial resources are attracted to good innovation rather than being the cause of good innovation. So resources are important, but they do not in and of themselves create innovation. Capability for innovation. And now I'm connecting back to what I said before about innovation competence and the possibility of educate for innovation competence. We need to have individual and organizational innovation competence in society. And we need to have that within the university, but also within private sector companies, within public authorities, within government, uh, within NGOs. Everyone needs to participate in this because all of these organizations are part of what I refer to as the innovation ecosystem. Innovation happens in constant collaboration and exchange and interaction between multiple uh, types of organizations in society. And for those, policy and resources and capabilities are the key things to build societal innovation cap capacity, but we must also connect them. We must build 
the innovation ecosystem. We must create that. I've seen in many African countries that a lot of these organizations in fact exist, but there is no system from the point of view that they rarely know about each other and they rarely collaborate. And this is where I believe an academic institution and a university can play an important role. An innovation ecosystem is something that stimulates and facilitates the creation and execution of innovation processes. It provides capacities to an innovation process driven by people. And it does this by building and spreading knowledge of the system actors. What are their capacities and how can they be engaged? And by stim stimulating interaction. And again, this is something a university can do more successfully than other organizations in society. An innovation ecosystem is not a membership or anything. It's inclusive and it's based on trust. You are part of it by your own choice and by engaging. So it's a cluster phenomenon. It's about creating knowledge about each other and building trust that enables us to collaborate. That's what an innovation ecosystem is. And again, academic institutions are actors in the innovation ecosystem. One type of actor, but it's also an actor that can facilitate the creation and development of innovation ecosystems. I argue that universities should invite other actors and stakeholders and try to create the platforms and the arenas that constitute the innovation ecosystem. And frankly, this is one of the areas where if I compare the average university in let's say East Africa with a university in Sweden um, or in any European country, this is where the difference is the largest. All universities in a country like Sweden have extensive collaboration and long-term collaboration, mind you, with a variety of societal stakeholders and societal actors. Something which I only rarely find in, let's say, East Africa and, and surrounding the East African universities. And that is something that I believe need to be developed. And, and I Frankly, I think that is actually one of the most, uh, most compelling deficiencies in this part of the world. There is capacity for all the other things in most cases, um, if these innovation ecosystems actually emerge. And I do believe the universities should look into that. So to close this, um, elements of academic innovation management, as I said initially, maintain develop and diffuse knowledge in ways that enable innovation. In other words, invite others to innovation. Innovation is a collaboration and the contribution we can do is to expose the knowledge that we produce and transfer through education that enables others to see the visions and the opportunities. We shouldn't keep that to ourselves. A lot of what universities do when it comes to, to, to knowledge transfer and innovation and, and so on has more to do with keeping it to ourselves than actually exposing it to others, which I think is a mistake. We should develop innovation competence through education because unless there are individuals and by consequence organizations that have innovation competence, we are not going to be successful in a way. And innovation is a craft that can be taught. It's a knowledge and a skill set, and we can teach that. And thirdly, we need to facilitate the development of an innovation ecosystem, because even if we have the individuals, even if they have the capacity and we have diffused the knowledge, unless there is the innovation ecosystem, it won't, we won't be able to sustain these in, uh, innovation processes anyway, to the point of, of uh, bringing innovation and real change to society. So I think I'll, I'll cool. stop there and thank you for your attention. Uh, I fully realize that there is a lot of, of probably a, a fairly large amount of information in this. And um, uh, I think it may have, I even almost hope that it in some senses have challenged your perceptions of innovation and, and, and the role of the university. And as I said initially, uh, you may not necessarily agree with everything I've said, but, but that I think is only the starting point of, of a good discussion. So thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Uh, uh,
Professor Sudoi, do I take questions, questions or you are going to take questions? questions? Professor Sudoi, please. Thank you very much. Okay. Can we all mute, please, so that we can take questions? Let's mute all. Prof, Prof can you take them or I go, I go ahead? Uh, since you... Prof, we are not getting you clearly. Can you sort it out? And uh, as I uh, start taking the questions, uh, we would like to take this opportunity to thank Jasper Vassell for this elaborate and very clear uh, presentation. I think this is what we have missed for a long time and it's come at the right time, just as the Vice Chancellor was saying, uh, because it has really brought a lot of enlightenment in this area. Now, members, I would like um, us to raise a few questions that uh, can be responded to by Dr. Vassell. Now, if you look at the section on reactions, if you press reactions, there's a place where written raise hand. If you press the raise hand, then I'll see your hand. It would help us to manage the question. So I would like to, um, to ask, I mean, if somebody has a question, please can you raise up your hand so that we can take at least first three questions, then uh, Dr. Uh, Vassal would respond. Yes, first I can see Dr. Lexa Matasio, followed by Dr. Enos Wambo. So can we talk? start by Dr. Matasio? Who is the third one? Let's get the third hands. We have seen two hands, yes, Georgia Ria. So let's start with Dr. Matasio, then Dr. Ayanos Wambu, and then Dr. Georgia Ria. So Lexa, please proceed. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Very well. OK. It was a very good presentation, though I joined late, but there are a couple of things that I've learned. I have a question to Professor. For example, I take University of Edward. In each department, I take my an example of my department, Biological Sciences. We have uh, projects that we do of, uh, to be specific, uh, MSc, PhD, and undergraduate. And most of the times you find you've done a project which looks like if you went ahead to make it an innovation, it would be. But you ask yourself, where do I start? I will give a concrete example, and I would love to have a guidance of how it can be turned into an innovation at the University of Edward. For example, we did a project with a student where we were trying to find out whether we can get micro which are able to disintegrate oils because we've just discovered oil in Kenya and very soon we're going to have oil spillage. So we did a project to find out in the garages, in oil institutions, whether we can have microbes which are very good at disintegrating the oil and we got them. And then the question was, what next? because that's a very good innovation if you're going to produce those microbes and sell them so that if we have oil spillage, like for example, in Tukana where we have oil, then it would help a lot in the country, not only there, in other places. So how would you turn that into an innovation? That's what my question is. Thank you, Lexa. Let's go to Dr. Wambo. Uh, um, yes, Prof. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Basel, for that very innovative way of looking at uh, innovation. Uh, my question is just simple. This information that you have given us, um, do you have it in a bound copy, maybe a book, uh, something that uh, somebody can acquire? To refer to that's my question okay i think uh there's one person who has been converted into this faith and uh, i'm sure prof is going to answer you lastly Dr. Georgia Ria. 
Yeah, thank you, Prof. And uh, thank you, the presenter, for that wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, I think <clears throat> there is some, you have brought something out between the difference between innovation and invention. Uh, I could like you to comment further just to demystify the fact that innovation must be a physical product only or something new, which is tangible. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vassal. If you could uh, uh, give a brief response to the first three so that we can take the next round. Sure, absolutely. Starting with, with the first question, what would be the next stage in, in, um, in moving towards an in innovation and innovation process in that case? I would say that what you described there was a hypothesis from the point of view that you're saying that you do have, I believe it was microbes with the, um, uh, with the capacity to, to disintegrate oil, uh, and that's a function of, of that. So it could potentially be used, and I say potentially, because again, it's a hypothesis. It could potentially be used in a situation of oil spill, for example, to dis disintegrate the oil. So I would say that the next step in, in bringing in innovation to that is so starting an innovation process by learning about this and asking the questions, in that case, for example, um, to whom is that important? Who would be actually using these microbes for that particular purpose? Secondly, since I believe there are other technologies for the same purpose, I would like to know why is this why is your technology, your solution better than any other solution? What would be the advantage of that? And thirdly, identify who are the stakeholders in this case and, and understand who would actually be involved, who would be positively impacted by the use of, the, of, of this technology um, and who would be potentially negatively impacted by it. So it, it's about posing questions which are actually in nature quite similar to research questions and then seek the answers to those questions. Uh, and that's what, what I really meant when I said that an innovation process is a learning process. So one technique that we have, have implemented in several places is to have what we call verification projects. And verification projects are based on questions like the ones I just post. Uh, and then we run a project by which we try to answer the, those questions and thereby we learn more about the innovation potential about our technology. And we may also learn that it doesn't have any potential. Uh, that, that's a, a, a probably even sort of a, in many, in many cases, a probable outcome of it. But that would be the, the way very practically to, to address that. Regarding the second question, um, uh, one thing I, I forgot to mention before was that I will gladly share the slides I used today so you can, uh, someone can get those and distribute them among all the participants. Um, yes, there is almost something written up on this because I'm actually in the process of finalizing a write-up of basically the things I, I um, addressed in this presentation. So at least I, I think I will be able to say that soon there is something written up uh, on, on this that, that I will share uh, with you. The third question had to do with the distinction between invention and innovation. And I believe whether innovation will have to be a physical product. No, absolutely not. Innovation doesn't have to be a product at all. In fact, remember that my way of defining innovation is that innovation is a change that is perceived as an improvement. A product is never, in my view, an innovation in and of itself. It can be an invention. When I do workshops on, on, uh, on innovation, I frequently ask people to give me an example of innovation, and then someone inevitably pick, picks up their smartphone and, and tells me, this is innovation, they say. And then they mean the physical object, the product. And I'm saying that, no, that's not innovation. Innovation is the change that the smartphone brings to us, the potential for improvement that it brings to us, because those are the things that makes you buy that product after all. It's not the fact that it's a phone or that it is a product or even a physical product. That's, um, uh, so innovation 
is definitely a change. And if you contrast that to the idea of an invention, for example, which is simply knowledge about how to provide a solution to a specific problem or a mechanism with a, a specific effect, that isn't innovation at all. In fact, I would argue that it's not an invention can become innovation, but only if it's being delivered to those who can actually benefit from its value. Otherwise, it's not. So it doesn't need to be a physical product and it doesn't have anything to do with products and, and services in, in the definition of innovation. The product is the bearer of the innovation, not the innovation itself. It's the bearer of a potential change. So that's the distinction I make. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, let's get the next round of uh, three questions. I can see Dr. Donna Lotieno, I mean, Professor Donna Lotieno, any, any other person? Let's see the three hands as Lexa brings her hands down. Is there any other, or we only have uh, Professor Lotieno, then we wind up. <laughs> Okay, we have Clement Kiptum and the last one. Last person with a question. Kudenyo. All right, so let's start with, uh, uh, we'll get four. Professor Dono Tieno, Dr. Clement Kiptum, Dr. Kudenyo Shibole, and lastly, Professor Julius Uchudo. In that order, please. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the presenter, Dr. Vassal, for such an enlightening uh, presentation. Now, my question is, uh, because from what I've heard from your presentation, there's a very different way you're, you're bringing to us of looking at uh, innovation. So uh, what, what do you think has made us focus more on uh, getting patents and uh, focusing a lot on intellectual property than what you have uh, indicated to us today. Because I remember, <clears throat> uh, for example, like the regulator of universities, there's a time they wanted data on, on uh, patents that uh, university, uh, for example, a university has produced. But now you are telling us here that uh, a patent is really not uh, an innovation. I mean, it's, uh, it's intellectual property, but it's not an innovation. So why would you think, why do you think uh, even the regulators, they focus on patents, on IP, and even ourselves as uh, academicians? That's, that's been our main focus all the time. Mm. Thank you. Okay, keep two. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Vassel Jesper for your insightful and informative talk. Mine is on uh, innovation ecosystem. You have uh, rightly put it that in Kenya, we do have uh, a gap between uh, universities and industries. You've also said that um, when it comes to development, we should not uh, use the the, the Swedish way of development, but uh, try our own method of develop, development. But mine, I would like to, to say that, uh, how can we use the Swedish um, mode of development in terms of uh, reducing the gap between uh, the universities and the, the industry, as well as other stakeholders, when it comes to that ecosystem, uh, innovation ecosystem uh, context? because you've seen that the, in our case, there's that huge, huge gap between us. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you. Let's come to the Professor Chudo. Um, thank you very much, Prof, for the, for the nice discussion on, on innovations. I think we, we shall have learned a lot of things in the end of this day. Um, you have said that uh, innovations attract funds and that funds are not the cause of innovation. While I agree with you that innovations attract funds, 
mainly because of uh, the example that you gave of Greta. She may not have had any money at all, but uh, she used an innovative way of raising an awareness. There, yes. But and there are other cases where funds are imperative. For example, the case that uh, Lexa asked, and you followed it by, by telling her that the next step would be to ask several questions and find their answers. As you do that, as you ask those questions and you, and, and, and you get the answers, and you may be um, forced to use some funds, isn't there a step in innovation that would certainly require funding? That is what I wanted you to, uh, to answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Dr. Chibole disappeared, so I hope, uh, are you there, Dr. Chibole? We lost him, so, uh, Okay, Dr. Vassal, just go ahead and respond to those three. And if you don't see any more hands, we could wind it up there. So if anybody still has a question, please uh, let me see your hands. Uh, proceed, please. Uh, thank you for the questions. Um, <clears throat> why the focus on patents? Well, um, I would say that it's based on a number, the, the reason there is this focus on patents is that there is a number of misconceptions surrounding uh, intellectual property and the role of intellectual property in innovation. I would say that there is a uh, particularly, and I've encountered this a lot, there is uh, uh, severe misconceptions um, as to the financial value, the economic value of intellectual property and particularly patents. There is, and, and we've gone through this process in Sweden as well. If, if you go back 10, 10, 15 years in Sweden, politicians expected uh, Swedish universities to make huge amounts of money off of patenting. And we're constantly asking, why don't you make as much money from patents as the American universities do? Um, and there has been a widespread again, misconception that particularly American universities and universities in some other countries are making substantial money off of um, uh, intellectual property and patents. That simply isn't true. If we take an example, uh, MIT is a university that most of us probably know very well. It's one of, one of the most well-known and, and prestigious institutions in, in the world. I visited them a number of years ago, and I visited their department for doing licensing of, of technology. Uh, they do a lot of licensing deals every year. Most of them, in most of them, they lose money. Even so, if you aggregate it, they made... $50 million a year on intellectual property licensing. And when I say that, then you may ask, but then they do substantial money from that. Yes, but it needs to be put in context. Those $50 million should be viewed in the context of a total research budget for the whole institution of $2.3 billion at that same time. So you needed a research turnover and mind you, the brand of MIT, to be able to generate $50 million from 2.3 billion US dollars. That is not a sustainable business. So if you want to look at it as a revenue generation and, and as a reasonable business proposition, frankly, it isn't. And the vast majority of universities who try to make money off of, of patents fail and lose money off of that. But it all is grounded on a misconception of patenting as being revenue generating, as patenting as being something that generates innovation, which it doesn't. Uh, it is an important tool, absolutely. So I'm not saying that it's unimportant, but not in the way people think. And it's not in the way of generating, for example, revenues for universities. And I'm extremely concerned when I learn frequently that universities in, in particularly in East Africa 
are operating under the assumption that that should be achieved. And they do so because there are governments and, and political layers who are actually saying that. But it, frankly, if you do that, you will fail. That may sound harsh, but you will. And if you do not fail, it's only temporary and it's basically the same as buying a lottery ticket. It's as harsh as that. You should look at intellectual property. You should take intellectual property very seriously, but you should do it in the, in the broader context of innovation. And you should use it as a tool to achieve a means, a purpose, not as an achievement by and of itself. So again, I think that the main reason and the answer question is misconceptions. There was also a question about um, um, the ecosystem and, and connections to industry and, and Sweden. What I said initially about not becoming like Sweden, that was uh, in the context of sustainable development and how to build a sustainable society. If we look at economic development historically, it has been about taking developing economies and trying to turn them into the same as the developed economies. My comment there was to say that we don't want that. We don't want Kenya, for example, to become like Sweden and to become a climate problem, for example. We need to change our ways as much as a country like Kenya uh, needs to keep on developing its economy, for example. So that was, was the reference there. When it comes to the practices of building innovation ecosystems, there is absolutely no, no reason why you can't sort of collaborate and learn from what we've done in Sweden, where this is one of the areas where I think the universities have developed considerably more than uh, in, for example, Kenya. The last question was about financial resources and the role of that. I mean, again, I'm not saying that financial resources are not important to innovation, but they are from the point of view that the lack of financial resources can kill an innovation process, definitely because an innovation process needs financial resources. But what I was, was aiming at was to say that it's a misconception that the presence of financial resources will give rise to more innovation or innovation processes. That's not true. Uh, those things are independent. And what I do mean is that if you develop interesting and good innovation processes, that will yet attract funding. So you can't say that funding is a cause for inno innovation. It's a necessary resource, yes, but it's not the cause of innovation. It's actually quite the contrary. Good innovation becomes the cause of, of financial resources rather than the other way around. Uh, when it comes to the verification that, that I proposed and the questions I asked, yes, you do need to do a project like that. Uh, my suggestion is that you look into doing it the same way we, we have done it in Sweden many times. We use students, for example. We set up thesis projects around these questions, for example, as a way of making it part of, of our ongoing um, the, um, uh, activities within education, for example. Projects like that can be extremely educational for students and very, very good projects because they learn from that and they learn innovation competence specifically. So that would be one way of doing it. But I mean, I totally agree. It doesn't come entirely without resources normally. So, so I, I understand the um, the, um, the the limitation you're bringing up and I'm very well aware that that, that there is a limitation in that respect. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we want to wind up the last, let me take the last round. Eh? That is Dr. Chibole, I can see you back, and then Tim Koske, and that will mark the end of our questioning time. Then uh, Professor uh, Sudo, you get ready after those two questions. Chibole. I think you are muted, Professor Shibole. Unmute, unmute, uh, Shibole. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. now we hear you. Can you hear me? Proceed, proceed. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there's a limitation network here. Sorry. Okay. My question is about the key. A Sorry, we have lost you again. Yeah, can we take two as key? Sorry. 
Sorry. To when you know you heard me. Hello. Sorry, Dr. Chibole, we lost you. Can you do it again? Do it again. Okay, I think that is a bit difficult. Let's ask uh, Tukoske, please. Uh, Tim Koske, is that process uh, hello, going? Hello, have you heard my question? No, please, we lost you. I was saying, what are the key things to look into when you're creating an innovation ecosystem? Okay, thank you, thank you. Let's get to the next one from Tim. Can you unmute? I think Professor thank, Doi. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Um, I, I was going to say that we have a number of participants in the room who might want to interact with uh, Dr. Basso, and uh, I wanted to give them a chance uh, so that they can ask their questions. If that is okay with us, I will uh, ask if there is anybody who wants to ask our guest a question. Raise your hand. Thank you. Can you ask the question straight away from there? Okay, thank you. Um, my, thank you. My question is about, um, you know, innovation is all about ideas and uh, generation of ideas. And how is it that we should, uh, or you should, you, one, you, you should promote active cooperation and improve the participation rates in idea generation in the innovation process. And as a result, to maybe engineer or gear the innovation. Thank you. Uh, we'll have another question. Yes, I'm Vincent, taking a bachelor of analytical chemistry. I want to ask you a question. Okay. You have seen that you have gone around the, go the globe and you have seen a minimum number of um, innovations. Is it because the teachers, they don't tell us why we learn a certain subject or is it because they are teaching us just tool but not the problem? Mm -hmm. We have one more. One more. Uh, thank you for that wonderful presentation. You did mention that uh, we can develop innovation competence through education. Uh, from your experience, at what level of education could this be most effective? Thank you. Any more? Can we ask uh, Dr. Vassal to respond to those three? Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I think I will start with uh, the first question from, I think it was from Professor Shibodle. Um, so, so let me comment on that, that first. Um, the key elements in building innovation ecosystem. I think the key elements of a strategy towards that is really to view it as a long-term proposition. And the best way of, of building an innovation ecosystem is to try and find the ways of building long-term relationships with a wide variety of actors in society. And, and I emphasize wide variety of, of, of actors because there is a tendency sometimes to only focus on industry and the private sector, but we need to bring in other parts of, of um, of society as well. So long-term relationships is, is, um, is an important thing to do. The second thing is to, as a university, create the arenas, the settings, the context in which you can invite these actors to have a uh, long-term interaction and long-term communication, thereby discussing the problems and, and not just the solutions. Um, and, and with the aim of learning from each other and as a way of transferring knowledge. But again, you need to create that not as a single event, for example, but as a recurring thing and providing an interesting content in that to bring in these various actors and, and have them interact with each other. It's not just about creating 
um, relationships between the university and individual actors. What you would get then is a set of bilateral uh, relationships. You want to, to create multilateral relationships. You want to contribute to have the other actors start talking to each other. Uh, so that's what, what you should do as well as a key element in that. And thirdly, I would like to mention that when you do this, you should do it thematically. Look at a particular type of challenges and ask yourself, what are the challenges within this area to say, for example, energy systems and development of energy systems in society and energy related problems. Bring in the actors who are, who have some kind of relationship to this. Everything from the end user to, to, the, to the private sector companies in that. And, try to create a discussion and collaboration on that as an overall societal challenge. How do we develop this? Invite them not only to, to tell you about their challenges, but invite them into a discussion by which you define society's challenges among these things. So again, long-term, long-term relationships, that's that what you should go for. There are many, many more things to say about that, but I think those are, are the most important ones. I think the first question we got from, from the room was about idea generation and, and, and how we can stimulate that and how it can, can come up with, with, uh, with ideas. And I do think uh, in terms of students and, and in the education and even in research, again, I think partly it's the same answer as to the innovation ecosystem question. You need to do that by interacting with others in society to a very high degree, because that's the only way you can start understanding the problems. Um, and understanding the problems is the key to be able to do innovation. Because if you remember my model of innovation, when I answered the question, how does innovation actually happen? Why, why does it come up? It's because someone have a vision an, a, a vision of an impact, of a need, of a change that we'd like to have and combine that with the capacity they think they have to provide that change. That can only come about through communication um, and communication over time. So this is typically something that would happen within the innovation ecosystem in, in that case. Um, I think then there was um, what I perceived to be more, more of a comment than, than a problem that uh, it seemed to be that, that uh, the university and the education provides the tools, but it rarely provides you with, with the capacity to understand the, the problem. And I do think that's something that we as universities, because I include ourselves, my own university in, in that, that we are not very good at teaching the students um, to understand and find out what is the actual problem. We give them lots of textbook problems and test their capacity to, given the problem, come up with a solution. But what we don't teach them is how do you find out if I'm really solving the right problem? I told you I've been working with innovation for more than 25 years. I've been involved in many, 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 many innovation processes, which means I've been involved in many, many failures. And what is the common denominator of those failures? Well, I cannot give you a single example where the reason for failure was that we weren't capable of coming up with a solution to the given problem. However, I could probably talk for several hours at length and give you examples of why we failed because we were in fact solving the wrong problem. We thought we knew what someone else's problem was, but it turned out we were wrong, which meant that our solution simply wasn't relevant or viable. It's not about being 100% wrong, uh, but it's being wrong sufficiently enough that, that, that you simply can't make an impact. So that's much more common. So I totally agree. Education should focus on training students to identify and really find out, am I solving the right problem? The last question had to, to do with at what level should you start training innovation competence in the educational system? May I suggest kindergarten as, as being a good place to start? Uh, currently in, in KTH Global Development Hub, which I'm running now, we are developing educational um, models for this exact purpose, training students in innovation competence, where a large part of that is understanding what is the problem. Uh, 
We are doing this at bachelor's level and at master's level and at PhD level. Uh, but I have also, uh, on my own time, tested out those methodologies, even at, at kindergarten level and, and have kids work on societal problems, kids as young as only five, six, seven years old, um, and, and looking in, into different problems. So again, innovation competence can be taught, and we can start teaching that at a very early age. So I really don't see a limitation uh, downwards in, in ages, to, to be honest. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, just part, I don't know if uh, Professor Sudo, you have something to say before I wind up. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. We we had other three presentations, and I can see we don't have time. I was oh. going to request that um, we give them time to shorten their presentations. And um, hopefully we finalize after their presentation. Otherwise, if you give me this chance to thank uh, Dr. Vessel for his nice presentation, for having given us time, actually about two hours, three hours today. And uh, we hope we'll be able to contact him later in case of any clarifications on innovations. Indeed, we have learned a lot we are now better than before. And I think innovation will be more meaningful to us now because of the understanding. Otherwise, uh, Prof. Raburu, would you like to invite the next presenter? The next presenter is Dr. Nandwa Musambai. Okay, thank you so much, Prof. Sudoy. I think uh... That is great if uh, we can continue. But just allow me to make some announcement. We are not hearing you. Oh, sorry. You're not getting me? Are you? Are you hearing me? There's no sound. There's Any no person sound. hearing me? We can hear you. We, we had lost the sound, yes. but it's so coming can hear you. All right. OK, I think that, uh, let me just also uh, join uh, Professor Sudoi for thanking uh, Dr. Vassel for um, that valuable time that you've given us. Uh, uh, please don't take it for granted because um, as a university, we really wanted to have a clear idea about innovations and the kind of uh, expositions that you've made and the uh, very well illustrated examples has really contributed to a lot of our understanding. And we just want to sincerely thank you about for this. And we hope we'll call you again in the near future uh, to maybe proceed on certain areas which are going to be more practical to help us to move, uh, to move ahead in this line of innovation. So I don't know whether you have any parting shot before we go to the next speaker. And can I just say um, a big thank you to, to, to you for having me and, and um, for giving me your attention and, and asking me very good questions. And uh, you're more than welcome to contact me in, in, the, in the future. And, and uh, I'm always looking forward to, to have more and, and fruitful discussions on, on the topic of innovation and universities and academic innovation management. So again, thank you very much. It's been an honor to, to, to be part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, members, I think that will uh, bring us to the first round, the second round, the second topic. Before we come to that second topic, I want to refer you members to a um, uh, um, message I've written up there. Uh, there is an Africa Europe Science and Innovation Summit from the 14th to 18th of June. We have given some link there and we would like you to join that, it will be running from 14th to 18th. But specifically, we want to request you to join uh, one about how to write competitive grant proposals by Dr. Sin McCarthy from, from EU, and for EU funding, that will be on Monday. So uh, for further, we'll further communicate on that, but uh, let us proceed. You can look at that and have the, if you need anything, you can uh, find out from us. Now, 
uh, Professor Sudoi, I would request you to call upon our second speaker. I can see his picture is already there, but please just welcome him and let us know something more about him and the topic he's going to present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Sudoi, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Aburu. Uh, Nandra Musambai is our staff in the School of Business. We recently attended a training with uh, Chespa and his institution virtually. And that's how we got to know about uh, Dr. Chespa Vassell. Indeed, he has the, is the one who has actually made this possible because he has continuously conducted him until this day has fruitfully um, been uh, accomplished. I now wish on behalf of the university, wish to welcome uh, Mr. Musambai to give us his presentation. Thank you. Kindly change if you are online to YouTube, a link which has been given on the chat. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, thank you for uh, being around for this session. It has been so good. We want to thank uh, Jasper for his presentation and all those who have come. Thank you, Professor Sudoi, for your cooperation and the management of the university. I will be very brief uh, because uh, some of the things that I'm going to talk about have been covered by our good uh, Professor Vessel. Uh, so I will just highlight a few so that we give the other speakers some time also to present what they have. Um, I was going to talk about, I'm actually talking about intellectual property as a concept. Um, there is commonly referred to as IP. Uh, I want to say that the IP is very important, a very important concept in the fields of uh, research, in uh, knowledge management, in technology transfer and, uh, and uh, generally in uh, innovation. A, a few terminologies, uh, what's an asset? Anything for which one anticipates future value, that's what we call um, uh, asset. In a simple uh, layman's language, we'll, uh, we call an asset something that brings money to your pocket, that's an, uh, an asset. Then we, we are aware of uh, tangible assets and intangible assets. In our case, tangible asset will be like real property, uh, chattels, like equipment, cell lines, buildings, and cash. That will be tangible assets. But what about um, intangible assets for an area where intellectual property falls? Uh, we'll talk about uh, debt, equity instruments, uh, contracts, and relationships. But now our area of interest, IP, that is intellectual property. Our good professor talked of uh, patents. Uh, one of the intellectual properties is patent, copyright, trademarks, and some statutory forms of uh, uh, intellectual property. But we also have non-IP. We also have non-IP, uh, which is uh, an asset that may include trade secrets. You are very much aware of um, Coca-Cola that has uh, continued to produce their product, uh, Coke, and other soft drinks for a long time because they have kept their non-IP, intangible asset, which is trade secrets. Uh, we also have um, others like um, publicity rights and domain, domain names. So that's what I wanted to highlight. And, um, okay, that's what I want to highlight, just uh, before, before that, before that, before that, key terminologies. All right, innovation and intellectual property. What is the link? We have been told already by our professor that um, innovation is about wanting to bring change in a society, in an institution, or whatever uh, you are operating. Simply put, Innovation means doing something new or improving on one, a product, improving a process, 
or a service. And many innovations can be protected through intellectual property rights. So we'll, um, we will we'll talk about intellectual property rights uh, very uh, briefly. Next um, item is the intellectual property. Again, we are referring to creations. Yeah? Next slide. When you're talking of IP, we are referring to the creation of the mind, the intellect. That is everything from works of art to inventions, to computer programs, to trademarks, and to other commercial signs. There are two categories of IP, two categories. Category one is what we refer to as industrial property, which includes the patents for inventions. You can use a patent to, 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 to have a right for your invention, or industrial designs. Those are the uh, the sign, uh, the, 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 the a product, uh, a products feature, color, and uh, whatever else. Or we are talking of trademarks. Trademarks are um, uh, things like uh, logos, names, um, uh, names, and words, and so on. Those are we call them uh, trademarks. And also we have geographic indications as IP. Geographic in um, invention, I mean indications, are uh, items like uh, when you are talking of a certain product associated with a certain place uh, in its taste, in its quality, or in its um, um, any other feature. We call it, uh, it can be protected through what we call geographic indication. So that's the first category of uh, IP. Uh, industrial property. Then we have the other category, which is uh, copyright and related rights. Uh, copyrights cover literary, uh, literary works, artistic, scientific works, also including performances and broadcasts. Now the next, uh, go to the next, um, next one. Um, uh, before, before that. The, the various categories before that, yeah, that one. Okay, if you look at uh, that diagram, you notice we have um, generally the, in the middle we have the intellectual property, and the various categories are indicated there. For example, we have uh, the literary and artistic works, and under that you cover copyrights and related rights. We also have new plant varieties, which covers plant breeders' rights. Then we have also another category we have is traditional knowledge. Traditional knowledge, uh, we, we may be aware of that. And then now what I mentioned, the industrial property. Under industrial property we have, uh, I've already indicated, the geographic indications. Uh, we have patents and utility models. We have industrial designs. Um, we have integrated circuits. We have the know-how and trade secrets. I've already alluded to that. And then we have uh, trade and service marks, uh, which covers uh, the trademarks uh, rights. So that is uh, that covers this as a summary of what we refer to as uh, industrial. I mean intellectual intellectual property. Next item. Um, when we talk of uh, patents. Patents, next item. Patents, generally speaking, when you talk of patents, we, have, uh, we are referring to what can cover your invention when you come up with an invention. How do you get exclu uh, exclusive right in, uh, as far as law is concerned? How do you uh, cover it? You cover uh, your invention by using uh, what you call the patent. And patents are often the first types of intellectual property that have been recognized in modern legal systems. Today, pa uh, patented inventions uh, flood every aspect of life, from electric, uh, electric lighting. We have patents held by Edison and Swan as uh, individuals. Those are long-time uh, uh, patents. We also have uh, iPhone as a patent or invention that was uh, is protected, uh, which is an invention of uh, the Apple company, you know that. And then 
uh, another way to uh, to secure your right uh, in, of invention is through utility model. And in utility model, we have uh, uh, simple patents like technical inventions. So the, the simplest way of uh, patenting is by using the uh, utility model, which is uh, uh, you, you, you will be patenting your uh, technical inventions. Now, what, uh, what is key now is the patent rights and enforcement. How do we um, have the patent uh, rights? How do you tell the patent right? And how can it be uh, re uh, enforced? Now, I want to mention that uh, IP law is a very wide area. Very wide area and very complex across the world, Kenya included. But uh, simply put, a pa uh, patent owners have the exclusive right to commercially make, to sell, distribute, import, and use their patented inventions within the territory covered by the patent during the period of protection. And usually, a patent is protected uh, uh, for 20 years. 20 years. So that's a patent. So that's how it is uh, uh, enforced. Now, uh, we are lucky to have one of our speakers is a technology transfer manager, uh, engineer Mbayaki, who works for Mo University. And he's very much versed with patent and patent registration through KIPI, our, our, our country, uh, uh, country organization called KIPI. What about uh, industrial design? That uh, industrial design covers the elements of product that are visual, ornamental, and the way a product looks and feels. Industrial uh, design rights uh, entitled the right holder to control the commercial production, importation, and the sale of products with a protected uh, design. Another area that you need to know about uh, IP is a trademark. A trademark is a sign capable of distinguishing the goods or services of one enterprise from those of other enterprises. And all sorts of signs may be used as trademarks. This may include words, letters, numbers, symbols, even colors, and pictures. So it is a three-dimensional um, aspect of, uh, of IP. Uh, and also may cover things like shapes and packaging holograms, sounds, or even tests and smells to some extent. Those are what we are calling trademark. If I asked you today, um, you, you are also vast, very, very well vast with uh, trademarks. You have seen it on uh, vehicles. When, for example, uh, I talk of a vehicle like a Mercedes-Benz, you know the, the trademark is what? Uh, that thing that looks like a steering, a steering wheel, isn't it? small one, you know that you are talking about what? Uh, Mercedes-Benz. If you are talking of um, uh, maybe Microsoft International, you have the laptops there and you know their sign, that will be a trademark and so on. So that distinguishes um, products of one organization uh, to another. Trademark rights are the best ways of uh, protecting a trademark and uh, it must be registered. Uh, depending on the jurisdiction or the laws of uh, a country or a region. Owners of uh, registered marks have the exclusive right to control who uses it. They can use it to identify their own goods or services or license or sell it for someone else to use. So that's, uh, those are the, the rights relating to uh, trademarks. Very briefly on geographic indications, on geographic indications. Geographic indications, the next slide. I've already indicated that uh, it is an indication uh, used on products that have a specific geographic origin and possesses qualities or reputation that are due to that origin, okay? And uh, in looking at the geographic uh, definitions or quali qualifiers, we look at a given quality. You could say maybe 
uh, coffee from Ethiopia has this particular taste, then you are associating that coffee, that that taste of coffee, I mean, the, that kind of coffee is produced from Ethiopia. That is geographic indication. If it is patented, then you would say, you give it a, um, a patent that this is what? From Ethiopia. Okay? You are looking at the reputation. So if you are using coffee from Ethiopia, for example, now you'll be asking yourself, uh, what is the reputation of coffee produced in Ethiopia? Like that. And other characteristics uh, attributable to its geographic origin. Uh, geographic indication need not to be a geographic name. It's not necessarily a geographic name. But we are talking of the quality, reputation, and uh, other characteristics. Many of you, you are aware of uh, what you normally call the, uh, this wine, you call it what, the champagne. When you talk of champagne, what comes to your mind? The country of origin is what? Is it France, isn't it? France, yeah, so champagne. So that is a, a, an example of geographic uh, indication. So that is it. Uh, next, um, then we have uh, other goods that can be covered by geographic indication. Next one. Uh, other goods that can be covered uh, by geographic indication include agricultural goods. I've already mentioned that. Uh, goods that have a natural origin. Goods of handicrafts, for example. Uh, goods uh, from industry. Manufactured goods. And foodstuffs. All those can easily be patented under the geographic uh, indication. How do you promote uh, GI then, for example? How, do we, how can you promote GI? We can promote GI or geographic indication by registration or considering uh, products of a particular association. In this case, we have talked of uh, uh, the origin uh, of specifications of quality, for example. And you can promote them uh, by maybe a certain logo or name, uh, although we have said it's not normally the, the best way to have uh, geographic indication. Or I said promotion through uh, marketing. You know, our, our first speaker talked about marketing as a way of innovation, like that. Um, next, um, this is a bit uh, jargon, uh, the next one that there are three main ways to protect a geographic indication. Uh, you will learn with time. I said the, this is a wide area, so with time you will get to know. One of the ways is uh, what you call through special on geographic indication laws. The laws that uh, cover, it, uh, cover geographic indication, one of it is called uh, the sui generis systems. So that's one of the laws. This is just um, uh, the jargon I'm talking about. You learn about it when you want to uh, to, to, to acquire some um, GI protection. Or you can use collective or certification marks. Collective or certification marks. You have already alluded to the fact that uh, we have what we call uh, the, 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 the logos covered under trademarks. Okay? Or you can use uh, methods uh, focusing on business practices, including administrative product approval schemes. So those are the three uh, ways that uh, you can use in uh, protecting your geographic indication. Let's move to the next um, IP, is uh, what you normally refer to as a copyright and related rights. This is a very common one. And it covers uh, the author's rights. Uh, is a term used to describe the rights that creators have in their literary, literary artistic and scientific works. Now, copyrights cover, or copyrights cover, enormous range of works, not just books, or music, or paintings, or sculpture, or films, but also computer programs, databases, uh, advert uh, advertisements, maps, technical drawings, among other things. So it's a wide area as uh, you can see. And there are also rights related to the copyright of creators that protect the interests of those closely associated with the copyrighted works, including performers, broadcasters, and uh, producers of sound recordings. So they are those, that's what we now are calling them, and related rights. You must have noted that um, certain people who came up with copyrights and registered them some time back they are keen, if they have, they have died, for example, 
they are keen to continue getting uh, continue getting a, a pay. What we call what? Yes? Royalties. Many years after they are, they, the owners of the copyrights have gone. So those are what you are calling creators. Uh, creators' interests are also, are also protected. And in some countries, this can, uh, can take 50 years after you have gone. 50 years minimum. Other countries, it is 70 years and so forth, like that. Those are copyright-related uh, uh, rights, and that's also an IP. So what does a copyright cover? It covers creative expression of ideas in many different forms. It can be text. It can be moving pictures. Uh, when you watch news, for example, in the evening over television, there is uh, the way uh, citizen starts their news, isn't it? You know those moving pictures, the designs, and all that. Uh, it can be sound, sound works. It can be three-dimensional shapes such as sculpture, architecture, reference works, and collections of data. So that's how uh, it covers. So I've already said that uh, uh, copyright covers the literary works, uh, as it were. Um, trade secrets. Next one, trade secrets. Trade secrets, I've said, is a non-IP uh, asset, non-IP, in the sense that for you to maintain that as an IP, it will depend on you as an organization keeping that as a secret. The day the secret is discovered, does it remain an IP? No, that will be the end. So that's what has made uh, uh, Coca-Cola, for example, maintain theirs, because they have maintained it as a... As a as a secret for a long time. So information that has independent economic value is not generally known, as, but known by the public and is subject to reasonable efforts to prevent disclosure, established by agreements not to disclose. So when, for example, you, you, you work, you are employed by Coca-Cola, one of the things you may sign, you will sign a, a pact with them that uh, you are not going to disclose their secrets to others, isn't it? Like that, so that's uh, some what I'm calling an agreement. Now, uh, the term, of course, in, is indefinite. It depends on what keeping it as, as a secret. Okay, like that. Now, owner, the owner decides who may use or disclose will disclose be disclosed to. Confidential information might not be also be confidential information might not necessarily also be trade secret. Disclosure is a springboard to recipient uh, for use. Now, uh, the typical exclusions may already be known and may be developed independently, disclosed, or required to be disclosed to the public if, if there are certain occurrences that uh, may, warrant, may warrant that. Now, let me conclude this by saying that um, um, Number one, there is um, intellectual property rights. And as scholars and researchers, and uh, uh, anybody involved in, in, in trade, you are supposed to be aware, generally speaking, of your intellectual property right. OK? Your intellectual property right. Number one, that uh, intellectual property right, or right, are the rights given to persons over creations of their minds. They usually give the creator an exclusive right over the use of their creation for a certain period of time. For the copyright, there's a certain period of time. For the patent, I've said it is uh, uh, 20 years. For copyright, they say it is some countries 550 years, others is 70, like that. Number two, what is the meaning of intellectual property law? Okay? So, yeah, I'm finalizing. What is the meaning of uh, intellectual property law? It's a law that gives artists, inventors, and other creators monetary reason to work. So you need to, when you come up with something of your mind, it needs to be covered, isn't it? So we need a jurisdiction. You need law to cover that. And number three, Using IP or intellectual property, you can manage knowledge and be able to foster innovation. You can manage knowledge and be able uh, to foster knowledge. Lastly, uh, the last one there, 
that uh, the IP chain of activities include, last one, uh, Albert, the IP chain of activities include creation, innovation, commercialization, protection, and enforcement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Josam, uh, he has really enlightened us on innovations, intellectual property. I liked what he put there, it was nice. You will bear with us. It's a bit of background noise because of construction. I want to do it this way because we don't have time. We still have Engineer Mbayaki. I think we better ask the questions at the end so that he can come in immediately. I will request him to shorten his presentation, maybe to 15 minutes if he doesn't mind. Engineer Mbayaki is currently working with the university, more University as a property, sorry, technology transfer officer. Previously, he worked with Kenya Industrial Property Institute. So you can see he has a lot of knowledge on IP. And without him presenting to us, we will have missed a lot. This is like summarizing what we have been told. Welcome, Mr. Mbayaki, to give your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Sudoi. Um, I must say that uh, this university is not new to me. You, you are basically a baby of uh, Mo University. So when I came here, I used to shovel between Moi University and this place. And I think a lot of uh, uh, projects I did, I did with the uh, University of Eldoret uh, professors. Um, remember the first patent I drafted was by, from the School of uh, Wood Science, Professor Tigni. Uh, we worked a lot with the uh, people like uh, Professor Gudu, Professor Were, in issues of uh, 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 bio, bio research. Um, I know Professor Chakun, we worked with him on the first more university policy, especially the, the review, like that. Um, I've been involved in, uh, I, I, and also I think you have uh, Professor Some in the engineering. It's actually Professor Some who pulled me from, uh, mo from Kenya Industrial Property Institute. Um, Kenya Industrial Property Institute is the organization of the arm of government involved in protection of what we call industrial property, as he mentioned. I felt it was good for Nandwa to present first so that we have a picture of what intellectual property is all about. It was also good the other man mentioned things about intellectual asset, but we don't want, I don't want to bring you a lot of uh, confusion for now. Um, so uh, Professor Some got me from Kipi, so we set up the, I think probably the first uh, uh, intellectual property management office in a public university or research institute, uh, probably in the region, Eastern Central Africa, apart from South Africa. Uh, so basically, we, we have had some history. Now, they, yeah, okay, just even before that, uh, um, so some of the slides, I'll show some examples of things that have happened here. Um, Later on, I think I've participated in mentoring some of the IP managers, not just in uh, this university, but also in the other universities in East Africa. I um, think I've must be, must, my hand should be in, a, in a Makerere, my hand should be in a Ethiopian, um, the Addis Ababa University, the Agriculture Institute there in Uganda, Agriculture Calro. We have uh, Mikocheni in Tanzania and Dar es Salaam, and probably other universities. Um, uh, other research organizations, regional uh, issues of uh, intellectual property. Because Kenya, for some reason, when we started off the intellectual property protection, we kind of were ahead of the other uh, 
countries in the region. So we, we tended to have a, a, a better understanding. Um, this was, Kipi was created, initially it was Kipo, after the invention of a drug called Cambron. Cambron was the first crack in the fight against HIV, which was a sensitive thing that time. Just like we are in a pandemic now, that was the situation then in the 80s. Most of you are young, you may not probably understand that. So Cameron was a, a big issue internationally. Um, so Kenya moved quickly to set up the patent office, and we were the first patent examiners to be recruited. When I was recruited, that was not the ministry I chose, the public service. I wanted to go to the public, um, public works. That's where I belong. But I found myself just like Jab picks you and throws you where you don't want. So that's how I found myself in the patent world. So I thought we were going to examine, set exams for polytechnics because it was the Ministry of Science, uh, Research Science and Technology. Um, so we also started learning about patents and all those kind of things. Basically, this is a complex area. Now, one, um, I don't have a lot of slides to do, but I will shorten them. The important thing I think I should do for now, because I still have my foot, I would say, that was the mandate of me coming to Moore University, was to set up intellectual property management offices. I was supposed to do it for three years because it was a secondment. Then move to another university and move to another one. And we were persuaded when we said examining patents. Basically, like me, I was trained in the Swedish patent office. And I even when I was in Moy, I went back for training in, yeah, in issues. Because when I went for the first training was majorly in industrial property. Then I went back to train on things of, uh, uh, in, the, in Sweden, southern Sweden, a place called Lund, uh, to train in issues of, uh, of, uh, of uh, genetic resources and indigenous knowledge, that area, um, which basically I eventually uh, team, told team went through the same. Nando is going through the same. I think I've also recruited Luta in this university. I think he's uh, somebody, I think he's just uh, completed his PhD. He's also pursuing the same line. Um, what, was, what did we find out after we started training in Kipi? We found out that most of the patents we were examining were not Kenyan, they were foreign. Then the question is, why are we examining foreigners' patents where our people? Is it that they don't invent? Now, that's one thing to ponder about. So we had to start thinking of how to spread out. This is when we started the outreach program. And I was in kind of the person charged with coordinating that. That's how Moy University uh, found me when I was, came and did a workshop here for all universities. Then, uh, of course, the other question would be, uh, one of the other things you start asking yourself, if you go to international meetings, which most of these professors will basically agree with me, there is a certain perception. There's a certain perception you get. And the perception you tend to get, you know, there's the body language, there's what you see. And you can choose to cheat yourself, or you can choose to say, this is the truth. This is what I'm seeing coming out, although they are not saying it. They're just being nice to us. There's a perception that when an African speaks, you are not taken seriously. You are never taken seriously. So I started asking myself, because I was in an international uh, meeting for all nations in Geneva, uh, that time when I was still in Kipi, just before I came here. And this meeting is going on. When the Japanese speak with their poor English, people are attentive. When the people from Netherlands speak with their poor English, people are attentive. The Chinese, people are the Malaysians. When an African speaks, people can go to the toilet, they can go to smoke. The seats can become empty. Yet we speak the Queen's English. So it's not the language, it's the production. So I started pondering over that. Kwanini Madarao. And one of the things that came to my mind is that there is probably this, uh, it could be coming from the issue that probably are considered stupid. So okay, fine, that may be the definition. Let's not just assume that. Let me now ponder on that. Why are we considered foolish? And I tend to think it's because the world has the perception that we have contributed little in the world of inventions as black people. Then the question is, is that true? And probably it's true, probably not. But I meet a lot of inventions for students, staff, and the like. So the only other challenge I get, I tend to think, is that we have not documented our inventions. We don't have systems that document our creativity. So that we also put them on the world market and say, hey, we have also been creative in this area. So sometimes, if you don't have, we don't have those systems, what happens? Some other person 
that has those systems in place will pick what you have done, what you have created, and run away with them. And you will say, or she will say, they belong to them. And you will not have a way of proving them. By the way, I'm so suspicious even what we call the internet itself. Where are the servers for the internet? We don't have the servers. They are basically probably in the US, the UK. In fact, when the internet started, even you look at my Yahoo email, Nando will tell you, it reads .co.uk. It does not read .com. The server was in the UK. Now, when you have the server, people in ICT, you know that. All the information trickles through the server. So the question I ask myself, are the inventions coming out of these big countries truly theirs? Or they have been done somewhere else, but because we can see and they have systems, then they are able to release that stuff quickly before you even say it's mine. You get that? So that's what we are going to talk about here. So let me rush through. It's just we don't have time. So then probably just before that, just, okay, well, it will come out later. The solution, let me tell you, nobody should deceive you that is the minerals on the ground that is the wealth of this nation. No. We will see that. Let's proceed the next slide. Uh, just before that, the slide, the other way, says, there's a lecture in Jumo Kenyatta who says, hey, we have to discover, each time we come to the university, we come to invent. We come to innovate, to invent. Go next. The mandate of the institutions is well known. Go next. We are at the, what we call the knowledge age. Some people are saying we are going into the industrial uh, revolution. And Africa is still in the, in the agri or just after the Stone Age or something like that. Let's go to the next. Now, this is what I want us to read that keenly. This is what I've observed in my interactions and in my trainings in Sweden and other countries. I've trained even in the European Patent Office. I trained in the Swedish Patent Office. I've been to Switzerland, been trained in other countries. And as I said, I've started observing. What is it? I just don't go to those countries for the sake of getting certificates running out. I want to know what makes these guys different from us. What is it that makes them manage their resources better than us? Because the one, two, three, up to nine is the same. They learn the same physics, the same history, the same ABCD, the same English. How comes they tick and we don't? That's a big question. Sometimes you may find that even Kenyans think better in certain forums. But the question they ask is, then what happens when you get home? This is what I notice. Just back to that. One noticeable difference between developed countries and developing countries is the speed at which decisions are not only reached, but executed. From this, it's not hard to theorize that these countries have recognized, whether consciously or otherwise, that the wealth of their nation is embedded in the intellect of its citizens and must be mined as quickly as possible before that person passes on. The wealth is in the brain, not in the oil in the wells in Turkana. If we concentrate on the raw material, someone else that is applying this, and in a lot of issues, if you observe, you are encouraged as an African to use the organs below your neck not above. And those who have gone to even to Europeans, you'll notice you are encouraged. In the US, they encourage the blacks to go for sports. Nothing wrong with that. But we will invent for you the shoes. We will invent the ball. We will invent the fields. We will invent the tartan that you'll run on and manufacture it. That must change. Research, technology, and innovation institutions are meant to think for the nation. And even the last speakers mentioned that, may just have passed. You are meant to think for the nation. Nations that understand that, they do not take their dons for granted. And the quality of education is paramount. These are the eyes of the nation. The moment you interfere with the eyes of the nation, what happens? Brain drain, you run away. This professor, a professor of civil engineer that I thought was still in Moy, told me, I am in South Africa. Because South Africa is applying the principle I said earlier, mining the brains before they die. Because when you have mined the brain, when you can do the invention, there's a slides which, some slides which I didn't put there, but they usually make people angry. 
I know the other man said the patents or whatever are not bringing money to the universities. That is a big debate. One of the men we mentored me from Michigan University, when we were doing the bio and we presentations in Nairobi one time, we took him to Kirdi, and he made this presentation, which has never left my mind. Yes, universities may seem not to be making money from the patented or protected innovations, but when you look at the bigger picture, the returns are big. When you look at it just from money, now look, if we are going to pump in money for this research, you know research is something you go into the unknown. But look at that 50 million per year. Let's channel it to the departments that are doing but probably that is just basically based on the technology, the engineering and science. But research, when you look at overall, there is research in arts, there is research in, uh, in, a, in a religion, there is research in, 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 in humanities, in business. No, so we, if we judge from that point, you see, we not get it. Then there are books. There are things being generated that produce income. So we must do an audit, an entire intellectual audit to understand what IPs are bringing to an institution. And it is very crucial for public institutions to protect the intellectual property. Why? The taxpayer pays for these walls and what you see here. If we don't, if University of Eldoret does not protect their patents, what are they saying? A Ugandan can access, a Swedish can access, an American at ease without paying for it. And wait, my grandmother paid for that invention to be manufactured. So they, you are not just protecting for the sake of University of Eldred. You are protecting for the nation of Kenya. You are the custodians of the wealth of this republic, the brain custodians. We cannot afford to just let it go like that. So you can skip that one. That is the process on which uh, ideas in, in the university. Ideas goes to an idea, it goes into research, then an invention, innovation, uh, development, product, then it hits the market. All those stages, intellectual property is involved. Break creativity must be applied. Next. University has resources that make it, gives it an advantage, a pool of intellectuals. We should actually move away from this idea that if you are doing biology, you do, cannot work with somebody in the business or religion or social sciences. If you are doing engineering, agricultural engineering, you are not going to work with somebody in social sciences. We need to know as you apply that, you need a social scientist. Now, I was looking at this thing where a vehicle, a new model is being, has just been manufactured. It was a clip which came. It's a clip, new model of Mercedes, I think something like that, some special car. It has a steering wheel and all that. And who is giving the advertisement is some kind of blonde. And the way they do it, you'll think she's the one who invented and manufactured it. But what do these guys do? They take the best to do the best they know. Engineers will not be there in the scene when she's talking about how nice that car is. The university has all that package. We must start working together and playing the game together. The students, vibrant minds. Germany, I was being told one time, uh, when we, keep, we had a, a, a German professor talking to us as a KP examiner, said they target the age between 0 and 25 for innovations. That's why they will encourage you to do your science congress and they will organize for you an exhibition there. I talked to another professor in engineering and said when they were in Russia, as Africans, they used to be taken there to actually pick those innovations from those children. <laughs> You have libraries, you have technology, you have ICT experts. Let's move to the next. Now, how do you use IP to unlock potential? Teaching. If you are going to teach, it should be also important to, especially in the technical fields, sciences and engineering, check what is the latest. Technical journals only contain 30% of new knowledge. Patents contain 70% of the new knowledge documented. Because as you are currently inventing in a certain area, will not, will not present in, a, uh, in a, a journal. And even the other guy talked about that, Jasper. So as a teacher, check that area. If you are designing a, a what you call final year projects, please, you better look there so that the students, when they are working on their project, that vibrant mind is working on the latest technologies they are aware. So they improve on it, chances are that that thing will hit the market and bring in the money. Um, you need 
you need uh, even that information right from first year. Because some students will even start having ideas from first year. And that will get messed up. Next. Research. I don't even have to labor in that. Let's just go to the next. Um, we need IP information to advise institutions. Now, I'm involved in things like when I was doing the bio and I was given an opportunity to do what we call the IP audit, to audit that project, to get the intellectual property. Now, what I do is, and the way I did it, by the way, the, the guy who was basically my mentor, the professor from Michigan, when I did it, we did it with Professor Kaimeni at that time, who was formerly, you know, the Minister of Education, just left. And when we presented, he actually said we needed to publish it because we did it in a new way. Now, the issue is, uh, this project is setting off. We need to audit it so that we can see what do we expect to come out. And if we expect, what will be the markets? And if we know the markets, we need to know the laws that will affect us. Patenting just doesn't aid there. Once we know the markets, who will be guard us? What is the policing? Basically, who will be monitoring our patents if it's in Malaysia? How much will it cost us? We need to do that in advance. And eventually, you'll just discover there are issues which are involved. And that's why now I'm recommending when researchers are doing their research proposals, kindly put money for protection of intellectual property. Put that component that so that you just don't finish the research and there's no protection. Take care of the intellectual property clause seriously. I was looking at the Moe University, MOUs and uh, agreements of research and all that. There was something shocked me. And I did that as my project in the, what he's doing with Jasper now. When I was doing that, was my project. Looking at the agreements of the university and ass assessing the strength of intellectual property clauses in those, in those agreements. <laughs> it was surprising. From 1984, when Moe University began, until the professor started understanding issues of IP in the 90s when Kip is doing the outreach, is when IP clauses start being inserted in those MUs. People that have been practicing intellectual property for centuries, two or three centuries, IP issues started in Britain around 16th century, and they are not, and they claim to be, and there are forums I question them, and you claim to be my friend, you know I'm doing something wrong, and you don't insert it. So our legal officers must take care of the intellectual property clauses, even if they don't take care of anything else in the university. The intellectual property clauses in the agreements must be concentrated, well articulated, well imagined. It's not a joke. That's where the world is, knowledge, economy. He who has lead to information will set the rules of the game. The boy with the ball, the boy with the ball, in the village sets the rule of the game. Not this way. Next slide. IP. When we have protected IP, we can go in for extension services. When you have protected IP, we will license it. We can sell it. They are all issues about technology transfer. There is also the way you acquire. By the way, we don't have, you hear people saying, oh, patents are expensive, they are causing drugs to be expensive. Hey. In fact, I want to encourage our universities, probably the next thing we should start doing, is, especially in the biosciences chemistry, is reverse engineering. How do you think India sells towards medicine? Most patents are not protected in Africa. They, talk, they care less. Why? You do not have copying capacity. Copying in terms of copy, to copy something. So we must develop a power to copy and turn them into and manufacture those drugs. That's why they are called generics. It's not necessary that they are poor drugs. Of course, some manipulate them to be fake. OK? But we must develop that capacity. And the universities, we must go into that area. You don't necessarily have to invent. Take the drug aspirin. Why are we not producing aspirin? Why not Panadol? Why are we not? Turn it and produce and sell. Cheap labor here. Europe has actually, it will come later. <laughs> Just go on. Consultancy. Governance issues. We should help the government in making decisions of intellectual property. Administration. You see, you enter the university in orientation, the staff are supposed to be introduced at that point. The policy of the university, should, IP policy, should be the first thing. Put them in a room, introduce IP on them. Students, the same. 
Does that happen to us? So there's a lot of leakage of intellectual property. Collaborations. You need it, as I've mentioned about agreements. We need to award. If somebody has used intellectual property in a certain manner, we must develop systems where we award and honor people who have developed intellectual property or utilized it in a certain way. We need to establish IP management units. We need to do IP audits. Management of institutions need to do their audit, know what the IPs are, the IP systems are like, and whatever, and make decisions based on their intellectual property. We may need, that is a very serious thing in the modern society. We have to make the management, as, in fact, in many universities, intellectual property, it is run from the position of the VC, nothing else, nothing less than that. Last week, we were in, last two weeks, we were in Naivasha, the Kenya, Kenya Innovation Agency, um, is now working on supporting innovations and financing them, and which I would ask uh, uh, UOE, I didn't see you there, I didn't see your people there. But the end of this month, we'll, Tim will I'll send you the link. And it will be important that the university sends their people there. They are working now uh, on uh, intellectual property policies for all universities and even non-public institutions. The issue is uh, they have guidelines. With those guidelines, we need to set up IP policies based on those guidelines. I know the, 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 the one for UOE is almost done, but please don't go there because it has to conform to the Nakosti one. I participated in formulating those guidelines uh, last year. Because if we go the traditional way, there are certain things we'll miss out. For example, genetic resources and indigenous knowledge, these are becoming a huge area. In fact, we think the next wars will be fought over genetic material. Like one of the lecturers, the questions he asked about microbes eating up the oil. That was a big issue in the US one time. That's not a simple thing. The enzyme you use in your detergents today that has replaced synthetic chemicals was actually something that was mined from Lake Bogoria. Kenya, by a lecturer doing her master's or PhD in Kenyatta University. No patenting was done. That alone should be pumping money in Kenyatta University. In fact, they say probably she got depressed and even died. She died, and they think that was part of her depression when she discovered what she had done and she had not protected it. Sad. So, I mean, another project where we have gone back to see whether we can mine more projects. Now, that one alone, the Android community, in what we call the Nagoya Protocol demands, requirements, are already earning millions of shillings. The first earning was two million. I think that some time ago somebody told me they have been sent to 50 million. They're able to pay school fees for their children. They're able to pay school fees. That small community. So these are not just easy, easy things. Eh? Next slide. We need to set up commercialization units. Eh? Next slide. And then there is something called technology scouting. When University of Eldoret will start churning out a lot of technologies and licensing them, what will happen is you will find uh, some of you as you graduate, you become technology scouts. You have trained in chemistry, but you hang around, you have a kiosk, just a place you live here, every day you are checking with the Department of Chemistry any innovation, any new idea, so that you can go and sell it to a company. You can tell them, hey, University of Eldoret has this. You just become a broker of technology. They're called technology scouts. <laughs> Next. We need to market them. We need to do boot camps. Uh, we need to study systems in those other areas, in those other countries. I remember one time we had to do, uh, when we were supposed to do a science park in Mo University, uh, you have those people who can work on science parks. Professor Odipo is very good in that. We, we, I was in the team he was chairing when we tried that in Moyen University. It didn't work out that day. But now, we, uh, anchoring on that, we have started an incubation center. Because you have to have an IP office and then something commercial. When Mo, I came to Moyen University, they had got it right. They had got it right. But I don't know what happened. They had to kill the company. There's one thing to, ma to manage and protect the IP. There's another thing to commercialize. You need another wing that just deals with the market. Because the systems we have in the university and the public service, for example, in the university I counted the signatures to spend money is about 25. You ask for money, it will take long. Pu private sector wants to call you today in the morning you're in the office. The system in the university cannot allow that. The late Professor 
um, this what this, uh, this guy with very heavy eyes from uh, from uh, after the airport. He's in chemistry. Dalut. Dalut was we were trying to do something in uh, Mohoroni, agrochemical. So we went there with him. And of course, we were, they had accepted what he was doing, but the problem is the financing delays until the company gave up. But also another thing that did happen is there is a way the IP office will handle the product and not the researchers. And they, I would tell, when we were going, I was told the professor, let me talk first, then you talk after. I said, no, no, no. So the professor and the researcher and the professor which team said, no, let the professors talk first. Okay, fine, you want to be When they were talking, the manager was sleeping. And reached somewhere where I think they were, the, the technical guys were asking so hard, so many hard questions. Now, when they got that stage as the IP manager, I stood up and took charge. I went, plugged my, my laptop on, and plugged the thing on the whatever, and stood there. And then I started explaining that project in a manner that is commercial. After that, the manager, me the manager said, you know questions, any problem? Yeah? Let's, let's, let's form a team and work together. Are you getting it? Synergy. Synergy. Let the, the boy who has the best or the girl who, has, who knows what, let them do their bit. Once you've done your bit, retreat. Let the other guy do it. Okay? So, um, let's move on to the next slide. Next slide. Uh, it gives confidence. When you have intellectual property systems, it gives confidence to industry, it gives confidence to communities, it gives confidence to, it attracts partners. Now, we, we one time when I was here, we licensed something on a to seed company. Ideally, although I also am to blame because we need, I need to follow up that because ideally that is like it was done during more university time. You have, if I'm not mistaken, we licensed the French bean to East African seed company. And we got one of the best negotiations in my opinion considering what I know it is in practice, 7%, 7%. And I don't know whether that was because some cases we put that seven percent as a beginning negotiation, and imagine the seed company said fine, which means they make a lot of money. Now, how many seeds are sold in Kenya, East Africa, per year? How much of that if it goes to the Department of Agriculture or Faculty of Agriculture? So, have we trained our financial auditors to be auditing that company? We had not set up the entire system. Who is monitoring what madam? Who is going to audit that company whether they have produced our seed? That is a whole area. Then there was an interesting one with the Kenya breweries, Bali. Kenya breweries approached the School of Agriculture. Uh, Dean was Professor Chuodo. So somehow he, he met me and we talked and said, I have this issue. Is there anything IP? They said, yeah. So I looked at the agreement and reworked it. Because the way Kenya breweries lawyer was looking at it is not, I realized he does not have an understanding of intellectual property. And I got in, I was a lawyer from, uh, that I'd kind of uh, been working with, basically like method in Moy. Then we said, no, let's meet them face to face. So we went to Molo, met them, and talked to them, two scientists and their lawyer. As we went through, we let the man, the lawyer run through the whole slides or the whole agreement and clauses until we got to the IP clauses. They said, please stop there, we take over. And we started explaining what we were meaning by material, biological material, and genetic issues. The scientists of breweries moved on our side. They were amazed. They were mesmerized, kind of. And to cut the long story short, the stakes just went high. And they freely allowed. They were willing. To, I really don't know how far that went. I really don't know how far that went. Because that was a catch. So industry may just need us to teach them what their stakes are. Because we were giving, telling them, if we get something, we will get 20. And no, the whole argument was they were giving us 8 million. I said, no, 8 million is not enough. Let's tell you, and then you decide whether that is enough. Don't you explain to them, to even they realize that 8 million, they were willing to pay more. We concentrate on sharing the benefits. And we showed them how they can benefit. And they were willing, they were now at, at ease with us because of intellectual property systems. Um, we have issues of uh, Nagoya Protocol now coming in. What I'm talking about, the Nagoya Protocol means what I talked about, the Bogoria. If the bioscience and social science are not going to domesticate the Nagoya systems in the universities, 
is going to be difficult to do, to do research. You are not going to take a biomaterial from any region or say you are going to do research on Mukombera without the lawyer's permission. You are not going to pick material from here without the Nandi's permission. That's going to be difficult. Some journals will reject that publication until you mention that you have permission from the community. So we are working on that project. We hope we'll be able to share with you and other universities. I'll call the technical managers, the, the IP managers here when we are finished at other universities and we show them that. So um, let's go next slide, I think that's, uh, The university needs to put in finances. Next slide, I think let me rush through and finish. Next slide. Um, we need to minimize bureaucracy. Bureaucracy say 25 signatures means this. If I think of an idea and I do not implement it quickly, that idea has not, is delayed. That delay on the global and the speed at which the world is running, that means you are late. So that's one of the things that is bringing problems in our continent. We still have systems of the colonizer when the colonizer has moved on. So we train our sons and daughters to do degrees, masters, PhD, but we maintain them as supervisors, not managers. That's a talk for another day. <laughs> Let's go to the next. Next. Um, Let's go to the next. I've already touched on that. Uh, then there are a lot of expectations of IP offices. Please, uh, uh, those also need the IP office need to explain them so they don't expect too much from them. Next. Um, um, that uh, the, our courts and the police force need training, and that's also an area which the universities can set up trainings for, short courses for those uh, crucial organizations of government, rather than we just blame them. Next. Um, we can go to next. I think uh, even that we can jump. I just go back a little bit. Let me see this last slide, just a bit. Yeah. Create desk for issuing government permits. Now, when we will start doing the for the microbes and social sciences, there are permits you get from government. One of the things, because of experience of working the, here in the university, and I realize the problems the scientists go through. From 2011, I started articulating any forum I got, Nakosti and whatever, and telling them no, we change. And I came up what you call an innovation. I came up with a simpler pro process. Let's transfer the permitting from those government offices and bring them to the university patent office. Because even you in Nairobi, you do not have the capacity to know whether genetic material has been stolen. You don't have that capacity. It's universities that have that capacity. So why stick on something that you can't do? KRA won't detect it when somebody's moving out with termites in their feet on the border. In fact, they will encourage them, say, this is rubbish. There's a, someone who went to the airport and said, told me, what are you carrying in the bag? The guy opened up and said, this is, this is elephant shit. This is giraffe shit. This is monkey shit. Ah, close it and go. Man, the guy is carrying microbes. The guy is carrying a lot of biomaterial that is unique. For the bioscientists, you know something is cutting their stomach. Let's move next. So we need desks that will take care of that. The government has tried its best. Um, of course, we need more. But uh, with the offices and whatever. Next, next slide. Um, for the IP managers, building results will depend more on patience of you, the forerunners in IP expertise than hard work. For me, it has been patience. Ideally, I should run away and leave this thing and go. Ideally. What is keeping me, in my opinion, me, he me understands, it is because of my religious faith. OK? Peter, when you are young, you do what you want to do. When you grow old, somebody else ties you and takes you where you don't want to go. For Africa to develop, we must start developing passion for something and say, I will attack this one. For me, I will attack this until Africa gets out of this mess. We must get dignity for this continent. It's personal returns may be low. Move on. Just finishing through. Thanks.
my question was on on the on the patenting. Is, is it a must that you have the the real thing, or even the idea can be patent? Yeah. Thank you. Question is asked. Thank you very much. Another question? Yes, come forward. Give him the test deed from <coughs> Yes. Thank you for the presentations. Yeah, I have two questions that I want us to <coughs> our colleagues to help us in understanding this. One, one, one is this. What roles can Kenyan universities play in enhancing innovations among the young generations who have got no opportunity of joining technical institutions or public universities? Number two, boot camps can be the main reasons why Kenyan universities, boot camps can be the most effective ways of enhancing technology among young generations. Why is it that Kenyan universities are more reluctant in establishing the same uh, boot camps? Thank you. Thank you very much. Another question? Yes, come forward. Yes. Come forward. Be, be a bit loud, please. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. I have a concern about uh, the patents and uh, okay intellectual property rights we in africa we just talk too much we tell ourselves we tell us so many on what we ought to do and we have governments we have policies and everything in place the Kenyan constitution is the best constitution in the world in terms of protecting this. Uh, but um, why is it that we are only recording highest numbers of innovation theft or maybe intellectual property theft? Yes, we might be talking about um, maybe registering this our patents, we must register or document our things. Uh, but what, what is the government and the institutions in general are doing to ensure that these young, okay, these um, maybe um, premature, premature ideas are registered early? You said that uh, we mine we must mine before they die. And are we really mining before they die? What are we doing? What are we doing to ensure, or what are we placing in place to ensure that we must mine before they die? Because this one must not come from the general public. This must come from the guiders or the leaders. We must have, we might be having so many things in our heads but when we just come here and present them what some of us experience is just humiliation and intimidation in most of the uh, okay maybe public presentations maybe from leaders politicians or our high professors or doctors such another thing is about um, um Sometimes we have um, people want to do some innovation, some serious, uh, maybe some small, small things, which you said when we look them from outside of in a bigger picture, it can be of bigger profit. What do you think in your own view that kills or, okay, that kills innovation or a quest for intellectual property rights subscription. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we better answer those three questions. 
Can I ask the respondents to come forward? Somebody will be okay. You can answer from there. Um, the, the sound is okay? Uh, the, the first question was about, uh, can you patent an idea? Um, it will depend on the idea. Because remember, copyright is an expression of the idea. Uh, but I, I want to look at it from your understanding from your point of layman. Because in the IP world, idea is something else. Uh, but it's basically, uh, you just do the copyright now. If you have a technology in your mind, you may not have the money to produce this technology. Because the essence of intellectual property, where uh, uh, the convention that led to people, I mean, the thing that brought people to write that convention, countries to write the convention for protection of intellectual property was because the protection systems were secrecy, which even still applies to Africa. You know about the, 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 the medicine men. They only pass on to the next generation. So if, if a pandemic comes and wipes out a family, that knowledge goes. So that's why the IP systems came in, especially parties, so that you exchange that knowledge with the government and you are given monopoly. So when you, you have even a concept, when the idea is in your mind, you may not have the money to produce, but you show it, people with money will produce a lot. Okay? So you will have to do it. We will have to write it down. That's why now the IP manager, like Tim has the skills to draft you for you that patentable patent when you describe. So yes and no. But solution talk to the IP manager. Question two, enhancing technology, um, uh, things like boot camp and whatever, why the university is not uh, working on that? Uh, the university having this, uh, I think they are trying to, to sort out those issues of enhancing technology. And also, maybe as you come to our side or the side of the you realize there are so many things and challenges Africa has, and they have been tackling those things step by step. But the reason I think they have such a workshop is to enhance that eventually, because they also need to hear. There are things probably they didn't hear at your stage. Okay? Then, uh, because, but your first question, I didn't get it. Second, talk, we talk too much, yeah. I, I don't know, uh, yeah, of course, now, there is what I said, you see those things like bureaucracy, 25 signatures. People, lecturers will, some of them get bored. So they would rather go and run a matatu, just teach their lesson and run to do a matatu, not research. So those are some of the things. The speed at which we implement the ideas is important. Um, uh, what is government doing? I tend to think the government is doing much. With, with, the, with the KIPI, with the Kenya Innovation Agency, the government is responding the best they can. So I wouldn't really say that the Kenyan government is just sitting there. It is trying, in my opinion. So some, what you need to know is the knowledge of those systems and so you take advantage of them, you make use of them. What kills innovation uh, quest for IP rights? Uh, as you said, they, as I said, bureaucracy, like now even, uh, to be honest, when you start taking your innovations, I know most of you now will start thinking of ideas and running to team. The truth is these two men, they will be overwhelmed. You can imagine the entire University of Eldoret. Even me dealing with Moi was overwhelming. So there are also, you don't, give, those are some of the things, discouragement because you're not getting the service um, you, you are supposed to get. Because in other countries, patent drafters are commercial just the way you see lawyers. You walk to a lawyer. So if the university is patenting, they hire that patent attorney. Now in Kenya, the skill was only in KIPI. So it's when now we are developing it in the country. So what we'll do for here, for example, is when, as we talk with Kenya and whatever, I will encourage, there's something which you as you can copy. They would bring people from KPI and elsewhere to train you on uh, your lecturers, some of your lecturers who want on patent drafting. That will ease some of the patent. I think that is. Uh, yes, additionally, it's a gentleman, I don't remember his name, but um, his, um, his concern was about uh, possibly what the university is doing about uh, encouraging innovation or creativity or something like that. Huh? I want to tell you that, um, for example, at the University of Eldred, we have a whole directorate uh, under our professor uh, Sudoi. This directorate is known as the Directorate of what? Research and Innovation. Put your ideas there. Go there for assistance. Go, you know, uh, engage our good professor and his staff in that. A uh, full directorate is there. Uh, secondly, uh, what we are now doing, and I think what Professor 
a few weeks ago, ago did uh, was um, creating awareness about innovation, creating awareness about research, creating awareness about uh, anything to do with uh, how you can patent your, your, I mean, how can you protect your, your right, isn't it? Uh, that was uh, a month ago, something like that. Yeah, you called it uh, Innovation Week. Please take care, I mean, uh, take note of all that's uh, happenings and uh, take advantage of them. And I've already said that uh, he's a technology transfer manager, but given that he works for more university, I mean, uh, for the fact that he works for more university does not mean that he cannot help us to have our, our registration done at Kibi. He can help us, he's our friend, and he's, uh, he's, he's one of us, okay? So don't keep quiet with the idea. Start in a small way and grow from there. And uh, cre uh, no, more awareness will be created as our professor continues, you know, uh, working for the director. Thank you so much. I'm sure there are some people who, on the, who are watching us on the other side. I would like to request uh, Albert if there are anybody who has raised their hand to be given a chance. Anybody who needs to talk? Elizabeth, is that? Asking if there is anybody uh, on the chat that wants to talk to us, uh, we will give you a chance if you raise your hand, please. While we are waiting for any response, I can see Ms. Pa Werunga. Ms. Pa, you want to talk to us? Can you unmute? <coughs> Looks like they can't get to us. From the floor, do we still have anybody? Yes, yes. Uh, Prof, come forward and make your question as we try to connect them. Thank you, presenters, uh, Anthony and uh, Dr. Musumbai. <laughs> Yeah, have a, just a simple one. When we have uh, defenses, PhD defenses in most cases, we do ask one famous question. What is your research bringing to the table that is new? From what uh, Dr. That this, yeah, Vassel told us the concept of uh, innovation starts with the knowledge and then you go to vision and uh, I don't know what else and then impact. If the answer to that question that we ask the students when they are defending is in the affirmative, that there is something new, where is the disconnect between what they do, and the innovation that we should be getting from every PhD defense or work that has been done. If we can get that connection, I think we will be having thousands of innovations in our institutions. Maybe you can uh, unravel that for us. Thank you. The two presenters, who is going to take up that? Um, thanks, Prof. Uh, that that uh, question.
question comes up often. The, in my opinion, the disconnect is one. Sometimes you find in the meeting, there are no, you need, in the other countries, they put IP managers in the defense. So that you can say this, although you publish, you have to hide this one, two, three out of it. Then they move into uh, protection. Um, that is may probably the major disconnect. Because they're able to see the idea, they're able to categorize whether it is a patent, a utility model, a design, a, a copyright, they're able to categorize. That's what we train in. Um, so probably that is a disconnect. Number two, uh, as I said, look at the entire university. Chances are that they will be overwhelmed. You remember, we, I used to be in the JSREC, but and you, all those things. And drafting a patent sometimes can take two weeks plus other activities of the university which this patent manager is supposed to be. So ideally, if you look at my details of what I was writing, I was saying, uh, I would encourage that before you even move in that area, build your IP office. Make sure you have the right staff. Understand the structures, recruit the right staff, put them there, train them, so that when you take off, you are not overwhelmed. For now, we can allow losses. But if we start it well, you will be able now to minimize the leakage of intellectual property. Uh, thank you. In, in line with what the professor said, <clears throat> the other thing perhaps uh, which may help us answer some of the concerns we have is that when, when we, are, we set out to conduct research, okay, uh, one, the in, what informs us to conduct research is that there is a societal problem, isn't it? So we want to conduct the research, find out the facts, find out what is happening and what is not happening, so that when now we get our results or, you know, the, we get, to get what our findings, we are able to, to solve that problem. But how is the problem solved? Because research is, is systematic, isn't it? So every, every bit of uh, the step of research must be followed, isn't it? So do we follow it up to implementation? That would be, if, if we answer that, then uh, partly our problem is solved, isn't it? Is it implemented? Our findings. Uh, he, he told me some years back, not long ago, that Malawi used to have uh, frequent and perennial food sh shortages, isn't it? But today, Malawi has even a surplus. The, the country exports to neighboring countries. Reason, when there was a president called um, um, Mutarika. Mutari, not Mutarika, uh, Bakili, Bakili Mluzi. Bakili Mluzi met one of our Kenyan uh, attache in uh, that country. And they talked to food insecurity in Malawi and so on. So what this lady, a Kenyan, told the president of the, that time is that uh, I have done a research in my country and I have uh, findings on what is causing food shortages. Then uh, this man asked the lady, where are the results? The results are back in my country. They are in the shelves. So they talked with the president. The president said, can, I sh can you share with me the, the results? So she shared. So the first thing the president did, when she found that those results were very, very critical in solving the Malawi's food situation, he did what? He appointed himself the Minister for Agriculture. Other than being the president, he was president as well as Minister for <laughs> Agriculture. The reason was he wants to implement. So implementation, a very important part in research. Thank you very much. I think um, I have experienced one of those technology transfer. One time I worked with the tea industry, and we had two types of farmers, the smallholder farmer and the large estates. We are generating technology every day at the institute where I was working. The people from the estate would come and take that technology and implement. And their tea yields were twice as much as the smallholder, just because of technology transfer. So I think they are right. The technology could be there, but application is lacking. With the transfer of it to the right person, and the application could be the problem. IP could be facing the same problem. So I'm seeing time is not on our side. 
we have, I have requested Tim Koske, who is in the program, to do it another day. He was going to sensitize us on our IP policy. What I have told him is we will try to upload the policy in our website so that you people can access it and read it. And one day I will ask him one afternoon to come and do his workshop or seminar in a workshop. Otherwise, I, are you agreeing that we end this session? Thank you very much. Um, can we put our hands together for the two gentlemen? Can we put our hands together for the ICT team? And can we put our hands together for being present? Otherwise, our office is open. If you have any idea, we had an innovation week last uh, in March, and we had 13 innovate innovations. Kindly prepare for the next innovation fair. Bring all your innovations to us. We will advance them and make sure they become tangible products. I learned today something, tangible and intangible. Next time, I will ask this guy, Musambai, to explain to us what these tangible and intangible assets are. Otherwise, I want to ask somebody to lead us with a word of prayer, volunteer, so that we close this day. But our office is always open. We, are not, we will not communicate with the people who are on the other side because the sound system was becoming a problem. And I know they would have liked to ask questions, but they have not been able to. So I don't know that they have written anything on the chat. Is there anything on the chat so that we can? Anything on the chat? Not much, which means they may not be able to communicate with us. Can we have somebody to close with a word of prayer? Let us bow down for a word of prayer. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day because we know you made it, Father, for this purpose in the name of Jesus. Today we've been educated, King of Glory, Father, on various issues, King of Glory, Father, regarding innovations, King of Glory. And we pray, O King of Glory, that, dear Lord, as, we, as they are being implemented, O my Father, we pray for the grace, King of Glory. As we depart from this place, we ask, Father, King of Glory, Father, for even a protection, dear Lord, in whatever areas, King of Glory, Father, we are going. We thank you, and we pray this trusting and believing. Amen. Thank you very much. You can live at your own pleasure. you have anything, Amy? A group photo, please. Let's go out there. Oh, we want to have it inside. We can stand, we can go out there and have a group photo. Kindly.